Hi, I'm Herb Wang, and uh, welcome to the DAS RCN uh, Day Zero Workshop at AGU. Uh, I see it, uh, a few people that are online. I'm actually here uh, in the meeting room at uh, Marriott near the uh, McCormick Place Convention Center. The uh, hybrid nature of this uh, session is new to me, and so we'll see how it works. Uh, for those of you who are online, we're trying to gather the in-person uh, group closer uh, to the screen. If they would come, I feel like I'm in uh, Geology 100 here, trying to get the class to occupy some of the seats uh, in the front. So yes, those of you who are here in person, please uh, uh, make this look like a filled uh, auditorium. Um, so we haven't had a meetup of the RCN, I don't think, since the AGU workshop in 2019 in San Francisco. So that is a long time. The DAS RCN uh, got started in March of 2020, just as things uh, more or less uh, went into the COVID uh, pandemic mode. So uh, we just wanted to have a relatively informal opportunity for everybody to uh, get a chance to meet at the AGU, which is the uh, way that we hope to incorporate disciplines other than seismology. The AGU family is fairly uh, broad, and so uh, DAS is a cross-cutting technology that can have applications in many different areas of AGU's interest. One of the uh, problems or issues that arises with DAS is that we are adding to the volume of data that would normally be archived. And so it usually draws some uh, community interest. Uh, one example that drove home to me the importance of having a data storage and archival system is that my understanding is that the USGS uh, has had difficulty adopting uh, the DAS because as a federal agency, they've had uh, the requirement that all the data that they collect is publicly available. And so this idea of open uh, and transparent uh, research actually reaches a snag when we're talking about archiving terabytes of data before we can even start. So solving the uh, data archival uh, and management uh, system issue is one that's really uh, important for some uh, seismologists to be able to partake in fully. Uh, uh, but then when we start talking about archiving such large volumes of data, uh, you run into uh, issues such as where are you going to do it, what does it cost, and what formats do we use. So we've had a data management working group, as um, I imagine there are participants in those working groups uh, at this meeting that have been looking at these issues. Uh, we had, I thought, a very nice community forum uh, a little over a week ago in which um, we had presentations by Zach Spica and uh, Rob Nellers uh, describing the work uh, in archiving and uh, the, the RCN. So this afternoon, we'll uh, start with uh, the, the first uh, half of the workshop to have some presentations. Uh, and leading off, uh, just to read the agenda to you, there will be um, a talk by Jerry Carter, uh, in which he will talk about the plans and progress for data archival at EarthScope. Uh, then um, Marine Denoll from the University of Washington uh, will talk uh, about a open storage object storage system uh, that's called DAS Store and uh, how the data will actually be stored is another big issue when we're talking about these large volumes. And then Brad Lepotsky, also uh, from the University of Washington, will talk about using data compression, using singular value decomposition. 
then uh, before the discussion, we'll uh, just introduce some topics. I'll review some of the uh, highlights of uh, Zach and uh, Rob's talks from the community forum on PubDAS. And I will also uh, introduce to, to you uh, some web surfing that I've done uh, from the astronomy community on a large synoptic uh, system telescope. And uh, they manage, they have a camera, right? You talk about how many megapixels your camera is. Their camera is 3.2 gigapixels. And so they transmit uh, something like uh, uh, 20 terabytes a night from Northern Chile. I just think it's a fascinating example of moving large data volumes around the world to a community. So uh, then, you know, what, since all of this is likely to cost some money, uh, how are we going to fund this? And so uh, Jerry and Casey will tell us about some proposals that uh, Iris has had in the works to uh, try to allow our traditional archival storage of seismological data uh, to be able to tackle these new large data. So um, let me uh, start the uh, real part of the program by introducing Jerry Carter, who I see online here, uh, who will talk about uh, plans and progress for data data archives. Jerry, do you want to take the, uh, the mic? Hello, my name is Jerry Carter, and I'm the Director of Data Services at IRIS. I'm going to talk today about the plans and progress for DAS data archival at Earthscope Consortium. I want to acknowledge the teams of developers and scientists at IRIS and UNAVCO that are building a system that can potentially handle DAS data. I also want to thank Chad Drabant, Henry Berglund, and Rob Mellers for providing slides for this presentation. There are three main takeaways for this presentation. The first is that metadata standards are in the good hands of the community who, through the DAS RCN, are defining metadata content. Second, IRIS and UNAVCO, or Earthscope, is developing a cloud-friendly data container as part of a system redesign, and this container is well-suited for DAS data. Finally, Earthscope, being well-suited to handle large data sets, will propose to offer DAS data and derivative product management in a cloud environment. So I've been mentioning the Sage and Gage facilities, as well as IRIS and UNAVCO and the Earthscope Consortium. So let me provide a little context here. IRIS and, At and UNAVCO currently operate the Sage and Gage facilities for the NSF and they provide data and products to their respective communities through independently developed systems. But very soon now, in January of 2023, IRIS and UNAVCO are going to merge and will become Earthscope. Now, this doesn't mean that the SAGE and GAGE facilities are uniting because the SAGE facility will continue up through 2025, as will the GAGE facility. They'll just be managed by a single corporation called the Earthscope Consortium. Okay, a little bit more information about why and background about why I think that Earthscope will be able to provide a DAS data archive. So it goes back to 2019 when NSF conducted a joint review of the SAGE and GAGE data services. Because no data is ever deleted from the SAGE and GAGE archives, it's, it was felt that the on-prem systems were not sustainable and that IRIS and UNAVCO should work together to integrate their data management system into a single system operating in the cloud. We call this the Common Cloud Platform, and the project began in the following year. Integrating and moving to the cloud is a huge undertaking. The combined repositories hold a few petabytes of data, and there are hundreds of thousands of data channels in our, in our archives. There's millions of requests received every day, and each year we deliver more than a petabyte of data. So DAS is going to add significantly to this load. 
It has increased sample rates and sensor density and increased need for large multi-terabyte data transfers and processing. In the coming years, we project that there's going to be a significant increase in the data input and output that we receive based on DAS and on other data types. We also anticipate that the facility will handle an increasing variety of data types, DAS being one of them. So what are the implications of integrating the IRIS and UNAVCO systems and moving them to the cloud? This is a large project, but it's allowed us to reimagine the data management for both the SAGE and the GAGE. We're trying to build an integrated multi-domain data access platform. We also want a seamless transition for users. We don't want the services that we currently provide to be deprecated. We're going to continue those services. But we also want to have services and capacity that aren't possible in the current system. For example, we want large data transfer possibilities, hundreds of terabytes. We also want burst capacity when and as it's needed. So computing in the same cloud environment as the data avoids this over the internet data transfer, which is a huge advantage for DAS processing. We also want to be able to have growth in the system, and it's very easy to grow in the cloud. We need an extra 200 terabytes, that's easily expandable. So our plan is for the CCP to replace the existing operations by the end of 2024. The DAS data handling would take an additional effort if we were going to become a DAS data archive. The CCP features and timeline, though, position it well as a repository for a community-wide DAS data. So this slide was provided to me by Rob Mellers, and I really want to thank him for providing it. This is the work of the DAS Data Management Working Group of the DAS RCN, and they identified challenges in sharing DAS data, and the first challenge is that there's no community standards that everyone agrees on for the data and the metadata format. So most seismic data formats aren't really a good fit for DAS data, so we've got to find something else that will fit. And I know that there's a lot of, some, some DAS data comes in SegY, some in HDF5, and I'm sure there are other uh, formats that are used, maybe ASDF, but um, there's no community standard yet for that. I do want to commend this working group for providing a, an excellent basis of the content of the metadata. They haven't defined a format yet, but I think they have decided or shown that it could be XML or JSON or some other uh, commonly used standard. But it's more important, I think, at this point to actually just find out what the content or define the content of the metadata. So that's the first challenge, is to come up with the standards for the data and the metadata. The second challenge is, be, is that data volumes, as we all know, are quite large for DAS data, and they are, in fact, they're so large that they exceed the traditional seismic data repositories. The IRIS archive holds about 850 terabytes of data, and that's easily ex exceeded by the amount of DAS data that's been collected so far. I want to spend the next couple of slides talking about the challenge of the data format. We're also facing this challenge for our common cloud platform development, so I want to talk about some of the prototypes that we're building. We've developed principles for the data container design. One of them is that we have a common technology. We have seismic data, we have GNSS data, we have MT data, and we have other kinds of data. We also expect data to come in the future, different kinds of data. So we want to be prepared and we want to use the same technology wherever that's possible. We also want the data to be managed in our data center separately from the, the scientific metadata. Whenever we get updates to data, it usually doesn't come to the data, it comes from the metadata. And so it's much easier for us to manage that metadata independently of the data. 
as we're working or developing our common cloud platform, it is in the cloud, and so we want this to be cloud optimized. So any any format or container design should be cloud native, and we want that's our first design principle. It will be great if it also works in a file system, but we want it to work in the cloud. We'll, we will have a use case in the future where we want to provide direct access to the data from our users or to our users. And so having it analysis ready is important for us. So the kinds of design activities that we're undergoing right now is that we, we've developed a GNSS observable container. It's uh, quite pr um, mature now and it's working quite well. We also have a PH5 container. This is a container that was a HDF5 container that was built for primarily for active source seismic. And we want to replace that with a common data container that we can use for all of our data types. Now the patterns we're developing in these initial activities are largely applicable to the data containers needed for DAS and other geophysical data sets. We've chosen TileDB as the data container for our development in CCP. It was designed for cloud storage systems from first principles, and it has an open specification and source code. It's also performant in multi-dimensional slicing via tiling. In fact, if you look down here, even though we're only showing two dimensions, you can have n dimensions, as many as you want. And it's quite easy to make slices either in one dimension or the other. We have support for sparse arrays. Now this is, in, this is uh, something that we need for GNSS data. If you look at GNSS data, it is quite sparse. And so we have to be able to keep, it's more efficient for us to keep sparse data arrays. It supports versioning by time. And it is multi-threaded, has multi-threaded read and write directly to the desk or the object stored in an S3 bucket, for example. This is an example of the type of work we're doing to optimize the TileDB format for different data types. In this case, it's the PH5 data type, which is used for our nodal experiments and our active source experiments. In this, in this example, what we've done is we've put the data into a dense array as well as a sparse array. And the differences in the performance come with how we read and write that data. It's much faster to read and write the data in a dense array, but it requires more complex application code. When we put it in a sparse array, the, the application code is easier, and, but it's not quite as fast. And so we've chosen so far and are trying a uh, a balance between the performance and complexity by using a two-dimensional sparse array in this case. DAS data handling has a couple of challenges associated with it. One is that data can be quite voluminous, as we know, and it's not easy to move hundreds of terabytes across the internet. One, po one possible solution to that is to store data near the CPU resources and provide direct access to the data. This is what we're trying to do with our cloud resources or our cloud um, system with the, uh, that EarthScope is developing. Another way to do that is to provide reduced sized data sets that are more easily movable. So one way to reduce is to create a standardized data product that is reduced in size. You can decimate in space and time, or both. Um, you can maybe find some decimation uh, formats. You can store little snippets of data you know, based on events and so forth. So we can create those reduced standardized data products, um, and that would be a solution that would come from the community and needs input from them. Another way to do it is to provide that data selection and decimation tools to be done on the fly. So you could actually define the data you wanted with the type of sampling rate and, and distance sampling and so forth, and then have that decimation done in place before 
moving it across the internet to your home computer for further processing. We've already covered the fact that DAS metadata content and format has not been standardized, although the DAS RCN uh, effort to standardize the metadata is very promising, and I think that that's going to be solved fairly soon. And the other thing is that the DAS can data container format hasn't been standardized. Now, we've been working on TileDB. We think that's a great standard for it. But whatever standard is, is finally settled upon, it should ease the researcher's data manipulation burden. I'd like to talk in this last slide about an EarthScope DAS data repository and the kinds of things that we need to still complete before we're ready to do this. We do believe that the cloud-based data management system that we're building uh, right now in uh, IRIS and UNAVCO and soon to be EarthScope is suitable as a DAS data repository. It's in the cloud. It allows for expansion of the, of the size of the data horizontally, and it, it seems that the systems that we're building could handle uh, the DAS data sets. But we do have a few remaining tasks, and one of them is to complete that cloud platform, and it is scheduled to be done in early 2024. At that point, we would be ready to start customizing it so that it would be ready for DAS data. We need to complete the DAS metadata definitions and format. Rob Meller's group in the, in the DAS RCN is working quite hard at that and is making tremendous progress. We need to develop a DAS-specific TileDB container, and we would like to have a community acceptance and input to that, as well as the input and acceptance by other data centers. If we're going to allow direct access to data, then all of the data centers would want to store their data in TileDB so that it would make it much easier for, for users to go to whichever data center is holding the data and to be able to access it using common tools. We also want to develop tools to generate and manage the DAS derivative data sets based on the community guidance. And we want to develop policies and strategies for data storage and egress. There are costs to this. Now we're building a system in a commercial cloud, and of course we have commercial cloud costs for our storage and perhaps our egress. But uh, even if you keep the data on-prem, you still have to buy those disks, maintain them, um, and, and replace them every so often. So there are costs to do this, and that's going to require some policies and strategies for the, for the data storage and egress. I want to thank everybody who showed up here today. And um, I'm ready to take questions, I hope. I'm online. Uh, if I can't, then I'm hoping that uh, perhaps Chad Trabant is there to help answer some questions. And I hope that everybody has a great workshop. Thank you very much. Hey, Jerry, it's Brad Lepofsky. I was wondering if, uh, if it had already been decided whether by cloud, do you mean providing end users a cloud-like experience, uh, you know, like they don't need to worry about the details of the hardware it's running, or do you specifically envision EarthScope moving to using uh, AWS or Azure or similar service for the actual hardware requirements? Um, you know, I know right now the IRS DMC, for example, actually operates all of the servers that host the data, um, or is that, is this all sort of still TBD? Thanks. Okay, so um, a very good question. The the we're we're developing our common cloud platform in AWS right now. We're trying to be agnostic so that it could possibly move to a different uh, commercial cloud vendor, but uh, we're doing that and and going into a commercial cloud because after our review, the the reviewers felt that with the increased size of our data holdings. Uh, we, we were having to renew our hardware every so often, not only add new disks and so forth as the size of the archives grew, but occasionally, uh, you know, every five or six years or so, the, the, uh, the technology would either make an advance or they would be non-supported and we'd have to replace the entire uh, hardware set so that we could, you know, keep going. 
And that's quite an expensive proposition, which creates a spike in our budgets every five or six years for replacing the entire, the entire system. So the one of the, the motivations for moving into the cloud was so that we could um, we could have a standard. Somebody else would then have to take care of all of that hardware. So yes, we're we're developing an AWS right now uh, as our chosen platform, and uh, at at one point we will probably will be able to shut down all of our current hardware um, as we move into the the commercial cloud. My name is Marine. It's my first time attending the RCN. I've watched a few videos offline, but I have to say I'm the newcomer here. And um, we've exper we are experimenting, uh, given that we're having data UW streaming in, on what could become a, a local cloud uh, system. And all of this work was put together within about uh, one week or two weeks. So this is extremely pre preliminary. But this grad student um, uni at UW is um, very um, computationally savvy. So we, we've been experimenting on that. So um, what we're developing is an open source object storage um, for DAS. And uh, all right. I've been putting a lot of it, um, uh, time thinking about data for seismology in part for seismic arrays. And what I've um, came across is the idea of having a metadata rich uh, data set. So even data, short windows, lots of earthquakes that have their own data, Lots of sensors that have different lat longs. And even data by itself is not really large, but it, it, it requires a lot of metadata to go along with this. Um, so when we combine arrays of seismometers that have different instrument or response, for instance, this is uh, the type of use case where seismology requires a lot of metadata. On the other hand, continuous, uh, uh, even, uh, continuous data for seismology, like ambient noise seismology or really data mining, tends to be a metadata poor uh, data sets. Like we have the same sensor at the same spot, but we have continuous time series for 10 years. And so in a way we don't package the data the same way. We like to think about arrays. We may have geophones, the only metadata there are let longs for these, array, these sensors, but the rest of the time series is the same. And distributed acoustic sensing also falls along the line of arrays of data, long time series, uh, lots of sensors, but still metadata poor. And so packaging that data and finding the optimal data format, as you just saw in the talk, is, uh, is quite of a challenge, but they, they have a different goal. So storing the metadata with the data is wonderful for packaging data and sending data along and avoiding having different servers for the metadata and the data like NASA does. And so some of these data that have headers or metadata with this, the data formats are SAC, SEED, SEGY, HDF5, and this ASDF form, um, container for H5. The other approach is say, we actually split that. We just have mostly the data on, on one file and we store the metadata in another file. And so this could be a combination of H5 file plus CSV and that's what the machine learning tool SizeBench uh, chooses to use. Or we can have a combination of MiniSeed, QuickML, XML, et cetera. Uh, the second problem is the type of data storage. And so Jerry presented that the volume of uh, DAS data is becoming uh, cumbersome. And so we, we may, um, you know, there's different kinds. The cloud, the cloud store here is a way of storing the data and, 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 and uh, organizing the data itself. We like to have the cloud storage close to compute. And so this, this is the idea for Iris moving the data into the cloud is we can actually get high throughput speeds between the storage and the compute. And there's an, an example of a Protomo, excuse me for the typo, that's uh, already uh, uploaded on S3. It's been a long time already. Data is in H5 and SegY, there's about 40 terabytes of data. And we've, we've built uh, tutorials to query the data in that way. It's been quite, quite efficient. The other way is to say, we'll just have this archive, just like what Iris has been doing uh, on the side and PubDAS shown uh, from the Zach Spika's work here. Uh, one of the figures from their paper, there's about hundred terabytes worth of data. You can access the data very easily using Globus endpoints. It's very straightforward. And to process the data, you just download it and process it on-prem, so on-premise. Maybe the Earthquake Consumption will have a similar system with the data there. Um, but really, we're, we're thinking about a model where the data is somewhere and you process on your computer, HPC, or whatnot, or you have the data on the cloud and you can process close to the cloud. And these are very different ways to organize the file system and to organize your, your workflows. And so I like to break the idea of HPC 
and versus cloud and really separate the type of architecture, although there is a growing overlap between and bridge between these two uh, type of computing. But HPC is traditionally very good for large files, few files, large files, edge file is great for that, and jobs that have large memory. DAS is large memory. So in a way, HPC is pretty good for DAS if you actually want to store most of your data on memory instead of I.O. Uh, but that system requires you to transfer the data from the archive to the storage because HPCs don't have uh, closed storage or they have a scratch system, but you have to uh, delete the data after 90 days. So it's not a viable option for the long term. You have to download the data always. The cloud store, on the other hand, really loves small files. Back to MSEED. We love MSEED in the cloud storage system um, on the objects. You can do a lot of jobs for cheap with low memory requirement. Again, DAS is quite large, but for seismology, or if you break it down, lots of small jobs are really efficient and you have a lot, you know, thousands of nodes. Uh, but one advantage is you, you could have high throughput speed from the cloud store. So that's that's the main goal of having uh, compute close to, to storage. And so really with DAS, you kind of want this in between. You want to be able to leverage these large nodes, large memory, but you want to be close to compute and you want to parallelize as much as possible. So we experimented last year on using uh, uh, work that NASA is leading on redesigning the H5 library to have a cloud optimized H5 called H5 core. So it's a static uh, file. So you cannot write like this, but you can read, um, uh, read uh, uh, thread safe reads for H5. And what we experimented is that everybody knows H5 does not work on the cloud. Data has to be downloaded from the cloud store to your local instance. So it still doesn't work for large file. So we were trying to find a way to minimize uh, the compute time for reads using this new uh, archive, because NASA also has that kind of problem. So H5 Core for simple data schema is extremely efficient. It has the same performance as if the data, the, the excuse me, the data file was on prim, like on your instance. And so we tried this with ASDF, because uh, there is that data stored in ASDF. And the way we interpreted this is the, the data schema for SDF is very complicated. And when we read a H5 file, we have to read the entire map of the file. And so every time we read, even with H5 core, it was just a very long read time just because ASDF is complicated in the way they containerize the data. So no results, but still quite interesting. So I'm proposing something completely different, not vetted by the DMC, but we just tried ZAR. And the advantage of ZAR, it's a, uh, it's a parallelized reads. Uh, it deals with n-dimensional array data. It was great for X-ray for the kind of like geo, um, geoscience community, PenGeo, all that. It's compressed, it's naturally shrunk. Um, it is readable by other languages like Python, Julia, these are my favorite, but you can also have C++ and, and others. And so we just tried this literally a couple of weeks ago and we have data from the OI experiment that was in November, 2021, where um, I think up to like a hundred kilometer of the data was, was collected. Uh, there's 47,000 uh, channels on this array. So this is the schema of what the uh, Celixa H5 file looked like. Um, so the data is saved in one minute file, 47,000 channels. And the data is arranged in these hierarchical groups and data sets, which is typical of H5 file. And so if we want to convert this to ZAR, it will be the exact same thing. It's literally the same thing. Instead, like groups become folders and, and the data sets become files. It's intrinsically a packaged uh, folder. And one thing that's interesting is chunking the data. That's where you get the best performance with ZAR. So we, we are experimenting, and I'll show you a few, um, a few examples on, instead of having this giant metric that you do not want to load in memory in most instances, you, the performance in reading ZAR in parallel is to divide this raw data matrix into chunked data that are very separate. And in that way, you can do parallel reads on all of these individual chunks of data. So you split in small chunks. The chunk is, has become a object under the cloud store I'll present uh, later, and it's natively uh, thread safe. So that's first first uh, part of this talk is to say, let's just try out ZAR. We haven't tried TardyB yet. But let's try out ZAR and see how it works. The second aspect is we were able, and this is in partnership with OI and what they've done, and uh, there's more than seismology at OI, so this is, comes from oceanographers' uh, ideas, is to use MineIO. It's a kind of cloud storage system. It looks like an S3 object. 
you can deploy it on, on local using Docker. And uh, it emulates a cloud store on your local computer, which is kind of nice if you don't have money to put on a cloud storage, you just emulate the cloud objects on your local. And so we package the tens of terabytes, not too big, the OI DAS data using this and in ZAR. And so here I'm going to show you a few examples of the seismologies, how do I see performance of a job? I have the data, I want to extract features, I want to collect all the data, give me the best performance. So the way I'm telling my students to work with is extract features, don't just like compute the read times and the memory. I want to see a seismologist crunching some data. And so we give, we're defining these small job cases where we say, okay, allocate some array, some, uh, array download the data or stream the memory in, uh, put that into an array and do some minimal processing like demeaning, tapering, filtering, picking the max amplitude. That's like the definition of a small job for seismologists. And the way we're doing this, we have 10 files of DAS data. So they are about a gig each in H5 or, or ZAR. And there we want to reconcatenate this, you know, one minute to two, 10 minutes, because I want to look at a one-time series of one channel for 10 minutes of data. So this is data reorganization, which we do a lot in ambient noise and even based seismology. Our hardware at UW, are, uh, we have a, a storage server that has, I don't know, 200 terabytes of data. It's pretty modest. It's got good speed, uh, some RAM. Um, and then we test the, uh, the throughput speeds between that storage and a nearby computer. So these are simple servers like Linux workstations with some, some memory, nothing super fancy. And so the, what I'm going to show you is this parallelization on-prem, so we don't have too many nodes, but I'll show you uh, examples on how efficient this system is. So on the x-axis, you have the number of processes, uh, you loves MPI, so everything we do is with MPI. Um, on the y-axis, you have the time in seconds on how long it take, took to do the task that I showed you earlier for this uh, small job. And then um, on the blue here, we have the ZAR plus MNIO configuration. On the orange, you have the H5 files, so reading H5 files and using SCP to uh, download the data or just having it on, on site. So SCP, uh, copying the data takes some time, but uh, you know, the size of the, the organization of the, the, yeah, the size of the data matters and the number of processes to do this matters. We got some saturation here. It's because we are using hard drives and not solid state drives. So the tapering comes from that. But we see a very nice scaling of doing this uh, much faster time with ZAR plus Manayo and also a nice scaling for the reads. Other things that we are concerned about is conversion from H5 to ZAR. And so this plot is showing as a function of number of, of DAS channels per time chunk. So like how small do we make our chunk and our objects? And so here it's saying I have uh, one DAS channel. So it's a really tiny amount of data, but I'm gonna have you know 47,000 objects to say uh, 50, I divide in 50 channels and I have you know, fewer objects and, and so on. So the, the maximum is the full matrix. Um, and so to give us some perspective here, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, the conversion time is high when you divide your array into all of these small vectors, that makes sense. And there's some tapering of that as a function of time, but it's still very fast. Like converting data to me as, is not um, the big problem. And um, lastly, on like the data uh, chunking, what's the optimal object size that would gain performance with that small job of reconcatenating and extracting features? Um, we use this 10 minutes of all channels, the 10 files we needed. We have the baseline here shown in red for the H5 file as copying the data and doing the reads on the H5 file and processing in Python. And so we have um, counting in this benchmark time, the, the compute time, um, and some memory we needed. I have these incomplete sentences because I'm still trying to figure out the system. But basically what we found is the bench, benchmark being H5 here, a uh, number of DAS channel per time chunk. We find an optimal chunk size where about 200 uh, channels per chunk size uh, is starting to give us a little bit of slowdown. Uh, but basically anything below 100, we were beating the performance of a, a H5 file on a local system. A lot of it was copying the time here. So you see this first overhead of time here is from the copying the data. So um, we found that ZAR has similar performance than H5 uh, on read time. And that was uh, strongly dependent actually on the chunking. And that was reported from other research fields that look at that. Uh, so it's, it's optimal provided that you chunk it correctly. 
Um, but we, there is also hope that the combination of this cat store plus czar could uh, give us some good performance. Um, I actually don't know how much time. I just wanted to comment. Oh, it went past. No problem. Um, thank you. Yeah, so just to conclude, I have some philosophy discussion I'd love to have after that, but we thought that Zara was promising uh, for that storage because the natural chunking, you know, we never look with a full array. We always look at segments of the dust cable. And so it's actually natural to think about it as subarrays. And uh, Minayo is really cool. It's really easy to deploy. Uh, it behaves like a cloud storage. And so we are starting to experiment cloud locally so we don't pay for anything because the cloud is expensive. So we're actually can develop all our tutorials using this, this tool. And we think that this can be promising for UW to distribute the data publicly in uh, several months. Thank you. I've never heard of Zara, so huh? you could give me a little more background. And maybe the biggest question in my mind is this is a new format. How important is it that a larger community other than that adopt it so that it just doesn't die on the fire? That's a very valid reason. I don't know if it's older. Oh, excuse me. I'm not used to this. Uh, how new is Zara? Is it uh, supported and compared with other, like, are we worried this is going to die? My answer is I'm not sure how old it is compared to TileDB. It might be older, but I'm not sure. It has the similar idea of many geospatial uh, data is stored on these n dimensional arrays. ZAR came about uh, at the same time as X arrays, which is mostly led by the climate community, which is a much vo more voluminous community than ours. And it has active, so ZAR plus X-ray together like work really well. Um, so the development is mostly from the climate community. And uh, I understand like uh, we're just testing things out. It is read by multiple languages. Like I'm a big fan of Julia and they're maintaining a reader in Julia. It's more limited than others, but I, I'm, this is research grade. It's not a company supporting it. So it has limitation, but for our research group scale, uh, PETA scale, but research group size project, I, I'm feeling safe about it. Provide, we're going to have to copy the data somehow, but um, I don't know if for the archival DMC, that's another business, but I'm confident that for our purpose, it's, it's, it's going to work. Mostly climate communities, big cloud, they really work on the cloud. Um, and so I'm confident they will keep maintaining it. This is going to be a little bit different. This is uh, a talk about sort of some really practical aspects of how uh, we found to work with a data set. You know, it's like tens of terabytes, which is about as much uh, images as people upload to Facebook since I started talking or something like that. Uh, so, you know, in the scale of things, it's a, a big data set from what I've worked with in the past. And we just basically wanted to do some data exploration. Uh, this stuff is all funded by. Uh, University of Washington, the Murdoch Charitable Trust, and an NSF Eager Award with lots of collaborators, uh, specifically uh, Dale, Leo, and Mark wrote the Eager Award, and, and myself, and uh, Marine Janol and EU assisted with some of the data storage aspect. John Morgan Manos is a grad student who helped collect some of the data, and uh, Veronica Gatella-Guetta is a grad student at UW who helped with some of the SVD analysis. So we have this DAS cable, it's in the Puget Sound. Uh, the blue part of the cable between HBV and CBV, those are two uh, shore vaults. Uh, it's about three and a half kilometers long. And uh, you know we collected data for about a year. This is a typical section. Uh, this is unfiltered data. It's just two, uh, I think two, yeah, two one minute files stitched together. Uh, there's coherent waves that you can see, which is nice. You know, when you're on land, you don't usually see coherent waves. We were expecting to see a lot of surface gravity waves, but it turns out that on an inland seaway, you know, they just, they're not as big and the water is actually relatively deep. So we do see them. We'll get to those in a minute. We mostly see these nice Scholey waves. Um, this is kind of an average uh, FK plot or a typical FK plot, I guess is what I mean to say. Uh, and just with almost no pre-processing, well, I guess, actually no pre-processing. I did nothing to this. I just took an FFT of the data, uh, 2D FFT, and then I took the absolute value, and then I took the log base 10 of it. 
you see these uh, higher order modes, which is pretty cool. Some days you see more, some days you see less. You usually at least see three. Uh, I think if you squint, you might see four here. Some days we see five or six modes. So that's pretty cool. You see like, you know, a lot of wave structure and basically we just get it for free. You know, you don't have to do any DV stuff like you would have to on land. So that's pretty neat. But the question, you know, we start asking questions like, well, what generates these? How does it vary? And that becomes a complicated problem because I can't just sit through, you know, there's uh, 1,440 minutes in a day and we collected nine months plus ongoing uh, to this day data collection. So, you know, I don't want to sit there and flip through, you know, 100,000 of these. So how do I find out if anything interesting happened one day? You know, it's, it'd be a really difficult task to find if there was some interesting event. Uh, you know, I could go through and look at days with high tides or days with big wind events or days with earthquakes or something like that. But, you know, that would risk missing something. You really want a holistic way to comb through all this data at once. And so basically I did the most boring thing. Uh, you know, this is actually, it cracks me up. This is something that uh, people on data science and machine learning websites call machine learning. So I guess it falls in the intersection of things that uh, Euler knew in the 17th century and things that are called machine learning. Um, so singular value decomposition. This is hopefully going to be just boring for a lot of people, just mostly just to spell out what I'm talking about. Um, so my sarcastic remark first, and then uh, we have a data matrix. So we just have the columns of whatever we're looking at. In our case, it's going to be the FK plots. They're images, but I flatten them. So every data point, every sample, we'll call it, is a vector. You put it into the matrix, and then you take something like the eigenvalue transform, but it's not square. So we call it the singular value decomposition. It's related, and they can be simply related through some matrix math. So we have dimension of M. That's just going to be the number of time samples times the number of spatial samples. And, and then we have uh, the number of records, if you will, n through time. And uh, we'll just call the, the equivalent of the eigenvalues or just the singular values. And now we end up with left and right singular vectors as opposed to just getting eigenvectors for a square matrix. So for data reduction, you just keep the few largest singular values. And uh, we end up with uh, the left and right singular vectors being approximated by matrices that have a dimension of M by some reduced dimension K and K by some, or K by N. And these just have the interpretation, basically, if you think about the dimensions, uh, M is like the original data dimension. So that's kind of like a mode shape, what you would call in traditional modal analysis. And the other one, uh, the right singular vector has dimensions of the number of records or the number of samples that you put into the analysis. And that's, that's kind of like a time series. So uh, this was really quick because I kind of just want to give you guys a flavor of it. Uh, it's probably going to be a review for half the people and nonsense for the other half, but hopefully that's enough to get you going. And uh, yeah, an important part is that this is the optimal linear approximation to the data, uh, to the variance in the data. So you can show that this is kind of like the generalization of linear least squares in some sense. So it provides the best uh, BLUE, the best linear unbiased estimator of the variance. Uh, so it's you know potentially upstaged by more sophisticated uh, nonlinear models like convolutional neural networks or other things, but we just want to do something easy. It's fast and it's linear. So here's what the results look like. So again, we get mode patterns, which just look like a representative data, a representative pattern in the data, and then we get these time series. And uh, first thing you notice is that I'm really bad at IT and things like maintaining an R sync of a uh, 50 megabyte file a minute for nine months sound really easy, but then you end up with data gaps when you go on vacation. And so uh, you can tell uh, the first data gap is during finals week when I was uh, writing the final exam. And there's another big one during the summer when I was actually trying to write papers. Uh, but I'll stop focusing on that. So the, the real thing we see, so you'll notice the first mode, 78% of the data set variance, uh, you see some, some of the Schulte waves, but you also see this big band going through zero frequency, which is just a result of the way the data are handled in the uh, optoelectronics that results in more noise at lower frequencies. We've actually fixed this with some upgrades to the interrogator. Uh, and then in the second mode, interestingly, we see the surface gravity waves, which are, uh, and I'll point with the, this thing for study online. So we can see these things at lower frequency. These are the surface gravity waves. And so in the second mode, we see the covariation of the surface gravity waves with the Schulte waves, which is something interesting that we discovered uh, using this approach. So I'll go into this a little bit more. In the first mode, this is kind of what uh, zooming in on a chunk of unbroken data uh, when 
I was making sure the data was syncing correctly. Uh, if we just take a, a F of T of the time series, and we see this nice seven day periodicity, which suggests anthropogenic forcing because nothing in nature has a perfect seven day periodicity, except for maybe the ferry schedule, the Washington state ferries, or people who have to show up at work at 8 a.m. on Monday morning. You know, it's, it's not tied, it's, it's, it's basically has to be anthropogenic. And so a uh, little bit more work to dig in. You know, I, I haven't checked, for example, to see if there's more or less activity on the 4th of July or something like that, but it seems like it's anthropogenic, uh, which is interesting because uh, as, as some of you will be familiar, you know, Scholte waves are thought to be the basically the, the physics of the secondary microsize. And so we're basically seeing here a non, you know, usually we think about the secondary microsizing as being nonlinear interaction with surface gravity waves, but that's not what we're seeing here. We're actually seeing maybe that there's some anthropogenic forcing of the secondary microsizing. Uh, in the second mode, it looks like this, and we have this big spike. And when we zoom in on that spike, it turns out that there were 60 mile an hour winds at the shore station this day, and the wind vector was aligned perfectly with the narrow passage, the Saratoga passage that the cable spans. So here we're seeing more the traditional explanation of wind forces surface gravity waves. Surface gravity waves have nonlinear interactions that uh, that go and excite Scholey waves. So uh, just as a summary of all of this, uh, you know, I think what I presented here was about 16 terabytes of data, and we used this data reduction approach to basically search for interesting things with an open mind, you know, trying to not constrain ahead of time what we were looking for. And we found some stuff. So we found anthropogenic forcing of Scholey waves, and we found this, uh, this day when the wind really strongly excited Scholey waves that were correlated with the swell. Uh, the, the data compression ratios on this is, is insane because it's uh, the best linear approximation to the variance. So, you know, you go from basically having uh, M times N number of data for a, for a dense matrix to having M plus N. And for the dimensions we're working with, that's about one part in 10,000. So uh, the, the data compression you get out of this is insane. And if you just include, I, I didn't actually plot the full spectra of the, of the singular values, but if you want 99% recovery of the data, then you end up still with like three times n plus n. So you're still down at 1% of the original data volume, but it's lossy. So you have to decide if that's okay. Um, I should add also, uh, you know, this is, uh, this has been a good thing to say in the introduction, you know, that this is why this is used so commonly. So this is like basically the JPEG algorithm for image compression. That's this is basically how JPEG works. Um, so lots of room for improvement. Uh, there's better ways to do SVD that are probably more appropriate for larger data sets. Like if you really wanted to do this on petabytes of data, you would probably want to do some sort of, of sampling or sequential approach that uses less memory. But for just the 16 terabytes we had, this was just fine. So thanks for listening. Following the gas that was very far <laughs> on the sideline. But um, how, like, it would be really nice if there was a, a compression scheme or a data analysis scheme that would be universally uh, adopted so you don't have to store all the raw data. Is, that, is there any hope of uh, getting there? Like, is, is there a way? I know different people are using different compression schemes. Is there uh, something that's kind of bubbling up to the top as the, the best thing, best way to do this so you don't have to explore all of it? So. Yeah, so a, a couple of thoughts. Uh, I don't know if there's something bubbling up to the top because I'm not really involved actually in the data compression world that much. This is just arising from a very practical need of uh, that we collected this data set and I wanted to publish something about it and we needed to figure out how to, how to look at it. So uh, this was not driven by like a, bigger effort to understand how it compares with other compression efforts or something like that. Um, but I will say that in terms of storing the data, you know, I think there's good philosophical questions that we can discuss as a community. You know, people talk about, you know, that we have to upload the data as it is, you know, untouched and archive that for the public. And I think in seismology, there's good reason for that with things like, uh, you know, ambient noise analysis driven by having all of the raw data available. You know, we have a slightly different perspective than other communities. Other communities, like in engineering, there's no way you would publish your raw data set. You know, that's your career and you kind of, you know, people are more protective of their individual data sets. Even in the medical sciences, it's much less common to publish raw data sets. 
Um, and there's other, you know, can be other considerations there too, like patient privacy. But for us in seismology, you know, I think we, we talk about that we have to have the raw data available, like, like it's written in stone, but that's really just the kind of standards that we have. And so I think it'd be interesting to ask, like, what if we just had a less performance storage system for the raw data, like cold storage, or like something like, uh, like uh, S3 Glacier, where they guarantee a latency of like three minutes, you know, which for stuff that you need online, you know, to interact with quickly, that's just, you can't do that. But for something where you're like, yeah, maybe we'll need that in five years from now, you know, maybe, maybe that's fine. And then you just serve up people something which contains, you know, one minus 10 to the minus five accuracy of the original data and has, you know, 1% as much data requirement, you know, that would really completely change the way that you think about data storage. You could really just have such less requirements. You know, I think it's interesting that Earthscope's moving to S3, you know, storing a petabyte of data on AWS at market rate is like a quarter million dollars a year. So, you know, that's that's easily a one FTE plus buying a decent sized computer per year worth of like regular old costs. I'm thinking like an academic FTE. So, you know, I, I think thinking about ways to, to do that in a better way, thinking about ways to optimize the storage are totally worthwhile. And I think we should be a little bit more flexible about how we think about as a community, what the standards are for, for storing and preserving data. Yep. So, I would like to piggyback on that question. I, I think the fundamentally, come from my, in my limited experience, there's not going to be a magic compression mechanism that is generally applicable. That does not exist. Compression on numbers, even series of numbers, is a well worn road. And there's lots of research well beyond geophysics that goes into that. So there's no ma magic moment. The magic moments come with combining the appropriately lossy compression with the appropriate analysis targets. So my question to you is I think there was this is the whole question for this group was derivative products, which ones are appropriate for storage alongside the raw data, and which use cases do they support? So in your uh, in your own description, yeah, the straightforward SVD protection mechanism. What do you, which use cases have you uh, ripped away, which are not possible with this kind of data set? And I know that's a huge question. You talked yeah. about that since. Yeah, I, I, I don't know is the answer. So uh, tomorrow I'm going to present actually more of the actual earth science about this data set that we've done. And so uh, uh, I guess the other sensing too. So this was actually funded, this project was funded to do uh, ultra stable laser interferometry. So tomorrow in the wave field gradient session in the afternoon, the group will present uh, uh, the results from that. And uh, you can rest assured the uh, correlation of the DAS data with the ultra stable interferometry is amazing with correlation coefficients of like 0.99. So uh, it's a teaser for the talk tomorrow. But in terms of the other stuff, we you know we did, uh, I inverted the surface, the, the Schulte waves to come up with a shallow velocity structure. And, um, you know, I didn't test whether that works just as well with the SVD compressed data or not. Um, you know, obviously I can tell you that for detecting the windiest day of the year in, in the Puget Lowlands, through surface waves, which is maybe the most obscure way we possibly could have determined that it was a windy day. <laughs> uh, it works really well. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's exactly right. Like I, the, what you said makes perfect sense. We want to think about what the application target is before we go and compress everything. And that, you know, I think as a field, seismologists rightly have, are worried about that, that, you know, for a long, for, for the beginning of the field, we only had uh, triggered data, and it turns out you can't really do ambient noise analysis with that, and that's you know basically makes a lot of older data collection efforts less interesting to to people now that you know just Rayleigh wave imaging with the ambient noise field is what half the talks at AGU on a given year or something like that. So uh, you know I think that we have good reason for wanting to keep that old data around. I guess I would just propose that maybe we do that in parallel. You know, if nothing else, it could save on egress costs. Sure. Cool. Well, looking forward to more discussions. Hi, so we're going to have a uh, discussion after the next talk by uh, Jerry and Casey on some vast proposals for funding. But uh, we, we had a very nice, as I said, in the introduction community forum a little over a week ago in which uh, Zach Spica, uh, presented on 
the data archive that he's established at the University of Michigan uh, that's called PubDAS and by Rob Mellers on data management. Uh, and so I just want to give a recap very briefly, remind ourselves about uh, several of their slides. And then I'm going to discuss this large uh, synoptic system telescope. Uh, but I just wanted to refer back to uh, Brad's talk is that uh, a plug for the DAS RCN machine learning uh, working group. So Eileen Martin and Whitney trainer Guiton uh, have that working group. The archives of some of their talks are at the DAS RCN website. And I remember a talk that Eileen gave in which she's working directly with compressed data. I don't know the, her method of compression for doing machine learning. So you, you don't need to uh, unravel the compressed DAS data uh, back to a time series. Uh, machine learning doesn't know anything real anyway. So the compressed data has the information and evidently you can uh, apply machine learning to that. So there's an archive of those talks. Okay, so just to review PubDAS. Hit forward. Oops. Now it should, I'll yeah. flick it. Now it should, it should work now. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right, so uh, I've been struck by actually sort of a uh, dearth of federal funding for DAS. And so uh, a lot of the interrogators have now been bought by uh, assistant professors on their startup packages. And co coming from a university uh, that's always struggling financially, I have always thought of the federal funding agencies as sources of money, and now they're turning into sinks of money. Uh, so PubDAS is actually the exact startup package, a part of it at the University of Michigan. So he's got uh, some petabytes of, of storage data at the High Performance Computing Center at U of M. Uh, there will be uh, a seismological research letters publication uh, coming out very soon. The, uh, the manuscript has now been accepted, but uh, it already exists at Earth Archive. And so uh, what uh, problem that uh, data archives address is the rapid growth of DAS data. Uh, and so there's about 10 data sets that are being archived. They're already on the PubDAS archive and uh, they will consume uh, about 90 terabytes of data. I think um, uh, Zach altogether will have some 300 terabytes. So there's a little bit of space to grow. And one good use of PubDAS will be uh, the Global DAS Month that Andreas was felt at NARSAR uh, has gotten a very good response on. And so February of 2023, we'll be discussing that when we look at uh, different upcoming campaigns uh, that we don't worry going to archive those. And so um, I, I think... Andreas is estimating something like 20 or 30 uh, terabytes of data for uh, Global DAS Month. So there's a, a range of data, different formats, different interrogators, uh, and different sizes, uh, many of which have already had uh, publications associated with them. And there is some metadata, obviously, that are in the, the publications, but Zach, uh, was uh, very uh, diligent in ensuring that the metadata that are uh, part of the PubDAS archive are formatted in a uh, very readable and accurate and useful manner. For example, uh, the tap tests that are used to locate the, uh, the spatial uh, coordinates of each of the DAS channels, which are being taken as the equivalent of a seismometer. Uh, he, he made sure that these were very adequately documented in the metadata. So uh, these are just some uh, visuals. I think these actually come from Rob Meller's talk about 
the different arrays uh, uh, and uh, monitoring campaigns that were carried out as uh, uh, that are in the PubDAS archive, and they range from dark fiber to uh, purpose deployed fiber. Uh, uh, at, at Wisconsin, we have a very small, if you want the smallest PubDAS data set, uh, it's just 10 gigabytes in which we just uh, monitored some blasts at a limestone mine just uh, north of here uh, near Fermi Lab at what's called the Lafarge Conco Mine. And, and that's why I can vouch for how, uh, how much uh, Zach uh, made sure that those of us who incorporated the metadata was uh, it kept coming back to me for more details on the, the metadata that we were submitting. So then you got to get the data that's at the High Performance Computing Center at the University of Michigan uh, to your site. And so uh, that will be done with Globus and Zach gave a demo. I, I, I have to say, that's a really brave soul that does a demo on a Zoom meeting because that's sort of the uh, sure way to have something fail. But Zach very smoothly went through a demo of Globus, uh, and there is a recording of that. So his uh, uh, success in actually using Globus is there in our YouTube archives uh, at the RCN website. All right, so the other talk was by Rob Mellers on the work that the Data Management Working Group has done. And in particular, they spent some time on uh, what should go into the metadata. And uh, a, a lot of the uh, metadata development has been done by Boon Lai at ANU. And then the other uh, participants have been Kathleen Hodgkins and Rob uh, Port. Uh, and, uh, of course, Rob Mellers. So the key elements that go into the metadata will be, you know, what was the experiment? What was the, the uh, cable and fiber uh, that was employed? What interrogator was used? Some record strain, some record strain rate. And so just, you know, getting the uh, specifics of the uh, model number and uh, manufacturer are useful uh, because then you can get more information uh, about the technical uh, aspects. So, you, you know, when you talk about archiving the data, I ask the question, you want to archive the original data, but you know, what's original, what's raw? Uh, often there's a lot of processing that's done within the interrogator itself, and then the, the original data that's actually provided by the vendor is uh, something like SegWi or HDF5. So the, the question of raw may just be, you know, what is it that came out of the interrogator? Uh, the acquisition parameters, uh, 100 hertz, 1,000 uh, hertz. One thing about DAS is that natively they can record at 10,000 kilohertz, way, way faster than any kind of useful uh, ground motion. Uh, so there, there's really uh, no need to store at those frequencies. And so uh, what was acquired as the raw data, and then what you might want to archive could well be a bandpass filtered uh, subset. And then the channel locations, uh, converting the cable channel, which is distance along the cable, to uh, geographic locations. There are many reasons why there are differences between the mapped uh, cable route and the distance along the fiber. So uh, there will be a poster tomorrow by uh, Erin Cunningham, in which she looked at a dark fiber survey on our campus. And the, the cable path uh, is mapped, but then every time it goes into a building, 
if you're doing uh, an installation, you include a lot of fiber loops so that you don't uh, uh, lose flexibility if some configuration in the building changes. So you need to accurately map the actual distance, which may include these uh, extra lengths of cable uh, with a geographic location. Uh, furthermore, the cable itself is usually overstuffed in which the jacket uh, distance is different from the fiber because you don't want to have uh, necessarily extra strain on the cables uh, so that it breaks. And so in the dark fiber, uh, they will actually add a few percent of, uh, of, of distance of the glass uh, relative to the distance along the jacket. So it's necessary to do the tap testing and that should be part of the metadata. Okay, so I don't. I guess I didn't realize this was a uh, uh, slide that I could have gone through more quickly. All right, so that's just a recap of the talks that uh, Zach and Rob gave last week. And then, you know, I, if we can borrow from other uh, communities on this problem of, of data storage, data transfer that I think could benefit us. And in fact, to me, there's a lot of convergence between uh, some of these uh, data problems. And so Maureen just brought up one that I hadn't been aware of in which this uh, Zara format has been developed by, what is it, the X-ray sacred tribe community. And so, you know, maybe those are images, but data are data, whatever they represent. And so the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope is a project of the astronomy community to map the northern, uh, the southern hemisphere sky from the clear skies of northern Chile, in which they survey the whole sky. Uh, and th they do this with this three uh, gigapixel camera, taking a snapshot every maybe 20 or 30 seconds. The net result is that if you have such a high resolution camera, you collect 20 terabytes of data a night of the night sky images. And it takes about three nights to survey the whole uh, uh, sky that the telescope can see. Well, they're looking at some very dynamic changes that occur within uh, galaxies over this whole experiment will take place over 10 years. So it's not a, intended to be like a static uh, picture that goes into an atlas. Uh, it's something that's showing you very uh, rapid changes within um, uh, the galaxies. So after 10 years, they will have 11 data releases and the uh, total storage will be about 15 petabytes, 15,000 terabytes. So uh, even startup packages, I don't think are ready to uh, accommodate uh, these data. And oh, I guess it's the uh, aspect ratio cut off the bottom of the slide. When they compare how much data the uh, LSLT survey will acquire over 10 years, I think it exceeded many, many times all the astronomical data that had been archived by 2011. It just struck me that that's very similar to DAS and that DAS will rapidly exceed all the data that IRIS has uh, archived over a couple of decades. So here's their bad data acquisition. Uh, you know, how do you grapple with a three gigapixel uh, camera? Well, each picture is the equivalent of 3,000 Hubble telescope pictures. Uh, there's a picture every 20 seconds, and they are scanning the night sky uh, for 10 years. There just is been discussed already in the previous talks, there will be data analytics that the astronomical community is planning to uh, uh, apply to these data. Uh, so they have software uh, teams that will be 
uh, mining the data and uh, they recognize that this software is critical uh, to the science of the telescopes and cameras that they built. So they uh, will have high performance computing, 150 teraflops for the first data release. And then by uh, the end of 10 years, they will uh, increase it to uh, close to 1,000 teraflops. And so uh, <laughs> one analogy with processing uh, these data means searching through all those, every TED talk uh, for every new idea at, and looking at each part of the video to see uh, how one frame may change to the next. So the scheme that they've adopted as a community is a three-layer uh, system architecture. And at the, at the end user end is what they call the applications layer. Uh, and this is organized around the data products. Uh, and that includes data pipelines uh, and products in the science data archives. Then their middleware handles the distributed processing, the data access, the user interface, and the system operation services. And then down at the base level is the infrastructure, uh, the computing storage and networking hardware and system software. Now, one large difference between LSST and DAS is that they have a single point source for the original data. It all comes from that three gigapixel camera in Northern Chile. And then they move that 20 terabytes each night to Santiago. And then they move that uh, to uh, Miami. And these are over 100 gigabit per second uh, dedicated links. Miami to right here in Chicago. And then in Chicago, uh, they have both an archive center and a data access center. Uh, the data access centers uh, in Europe, Asia, uh, and Australia will then uh, come to Chicago to create their archives uh, on their continents. So overall, I think this is probably a more massive problem than what we're looking at with DAS. And so if there's anything I think that we can borrow from either their organizational structure or uh, their uh, technology, you know, it just might be worth uh, looking into. So if you go to the, it's called the Rubin Observatory or uh, LSST, uh, dot org. Uh, they list their different working groups, and one of their working groups is one uh, that they call the Informatics and Statistics Science Collaboration, uh, uh, and they have uh, some 70 members in this collaboration, and, you know, you can read through the list of names, and sure enough, I found a, a person that's involved in this at the University of Wisconsin who's a data scientist in our statistics and computer science department, and so you know, if, I think if you're a scientist or a, a, a data scientist or a statistician, you, I mean, you could be a pure theorist, but often you, uh, you know, every biomedical team needs a biostatistician to work up their data. So uh, the statisticians sometimes seem to specialize in particular communities. And uh, I could see the DAS community as being an area uh, that a data scientist might, you know, gain some domain expertise as long as well as her uh, background in uh, data science per se. So this 70 person working group has this combination of astronomers, statisticians, computer scientists, and machine learning researchers. Uh, but what they have in common is sharing the objective of addressing the inference challenges facing LSST uh, to meet its science goals. And so I see some parallels that might be worth uh, our community looking into. Okay. 
we're just going to go ahead and uh, move on through our program, which is um, you know much looser at this point. So if we do have comments that you'd like to make or some something else, some other topic you'd like to bring up, um, please feel free to do so. This the whole point of this is to really get these ideas out there, um, start generating some conversation and discussion um, while we're in these communities, both in person and then also virtually, and continue them later on. So. Um, with that, though, we'll we'll start with the the first um, going back to to what our program was um, to sort of address the, the issue of of funding some of these initiatives and what what um, has been done already uh, in that area, and then also what strategies we might employ going forward based on uh, reviews we've gotten back and um, other feedback. So, um, Bob, would you like to? Yeah. Sure. Yes. Leave the microphone like that. Um, you can leave it. You can put it up again. Okay. Right, just it's just we're getting the yeah. Get up like that. Okay, so uh, I think if Jerry was here in the room, we'd probably have him do this section. But it's probably a little easier for me to do it being being here. Uh, and Jerry can chime in if he wants to make some additional points. So I wanted to talk about the idea of um, EarthScope, the merged new merged organization resulting from Iris and UNAVCO, really pursuing setting up a system for archiving and managing DAS data. And so I'll start out by just giving you a little history on that. A couple of years ago, we did put forward a proposal to the NSF Midscale Research Infrastructure Solicitation, and it was a proposal to essentially do the work to architect a DAS data management system. It wasn't to fully implement it, but we recognized there was a fair amount of work to architect such a system. And that proposal was declined. And some of the substantial part of the feedback from NSF was it wasn't clear we had done enough uh, community building and research on what the community needs. And, you know, it, in some ways, I think that was probably fair criticism. Um, the DAS community is very broad. It's very diverse. People using DAS for many different things. And we, in the proposal, were trying to identify that we wanted to serve more than just the, you know, the earthquake seismology community. We recognize this. There's a broad community that, that needs to be served. And so, yeah, so the, the feedback was we needed to do a little more work, do our homework on community building, finding out what the community needs. And so, you know, as we've gone forward these last couple of years, we we have been asked many times uh, at at Iris to to start to work towards creating a uh, a system for managing, archiving, distributing DAS data. We've thought a lot about it. Jerry gave a nice talk this morning, or earlier this afternoon, I should say. Um, <clears throat> about some of the work we're doing on the common cloud platform and how we believe that that can be, you know, that that's a good framework for uh, managing DAS. But I think the challenge we have now is how do we go about making sure we've heard from the community on what it is all of you need, whether you're uh, somebody that's doing DAS experiments and delivering data, whether you're just a DAS user, you want to be able to go to an archive and download DAS data, or as we were talking about with the common cloud platform, you want to be able to bring your code to the DAS data that might be in the cloud. And then there's questions about metadata management. There's questions about, we heard some discussion about uh, storing raw data, storing data in lossy, compressed lossy formats, lossless formats. So there's lots of details to be worked out. There's many different needs. And so one of the things that uh, for EarthScope going forward, we would like to put in another proposal to try to get some kind of a systematic DAS data management system created and implemented. Uh, but how do we go about getting that community feedback? And so I'd be interested even hearing today from the people that are in the room on what all of you need, what are your perspectives on this? Uh, but we probably need to broaden that out to a group that's even larger than this as we go forward. And so if people have feedback on this, I would love to hear it. I guess I'd also mention that the other thing that, you know, as an organization that operates facilities for NSF, the other thing we hear about sometimes is we, we get the question, well, is, is the Pascal Instrument Center going to manage or add DAS interrogators to its instrument pool? And that I think is a tougher question because the technology is changing quickly. 
Uh, some people are just buying interrogators uh, that, that they need to do their work. The price point on interrogators is changing. The technology is changing. So we're kind of going a little slower there as to whether that's something we should plunge into and try to, to get funding and establish a, a pool of, uh, of interrogators. Jury's, jury's out on that, or maybe I should say the community's out on that. We, we don't have a clear, uh, clear guidance on that. But we've been asked, it seems much clearer on the data management side. We've heard over and over again that uh, this would be the natural uh, place to do the data management, but we need to make sure we're, if, if we do, we're representing community. So that's kind of my, my, my pitch here, and I'd love to hear from people. Since this is more of a discussion part of the, the session, I'd be happy to get feedback. I see Chad. Okay. Additional comments on that. That there's there I think has been sometimes the perception that this is it, this is just a data volume problem. And I would like to add some caveats to that or a clarification. Actually, could you if oh, if yeah, that'd be great. Now I regret. <laughs> well, no, I mean if you can make some comments, it's it'd be great because we've actually got a pretty fair number of people up. <laughs> that clapping guy. Um that, I told him uh, some additional comments about the yes, the record, the requested need for a DAS facility or data management facility for DAS has been uh, the, the drum's been beating and get a, getting a little bit louder for a number of years now. It is not as simple as more seismic data. It's not just higher rate seismic data. So an important aspect for us and the reason we went for part of the reason we went for a proposal and part of the reason we want to do it right is because it's different in important ways. It's accessed differently. It's so in terms of processing and how that needs to be facilitated, it has different metadata. That's really important. So when we saw that list of metadata earlier, this does not fit into seismic things. It is not just more seismic data. So, and I think that was really important recognition early on that we couldn't just treat it like that and has the implications of we actually need to develop the foundation for what it is. And it's been moving so fast that it's very hard to put your finger on in terms of what's the appropriate metadata. But what's the, there's only two kinds of fibers. Now there's well more than two kinds of fibers. So it's changing rapidly. So we need to work on it, not just grow data volumes. Sorry. Super. No, that's great. Thank you, Chad. Yeah, and I think that you know, maybe just to, to to pick up on that a little bit. Other things we've we've heard are the you know the difference between archiving raw data and whether then as a data center we would do some standardized pre-processing on that raw data to generate uh, a data set that's that's reduced in some ways that and maybe in some standard way. Maybe that's a service that the that a data center could provide is to do some kind of uh, data reduction, filtering, decimation, what have you, uh, that goes from a raw data set down to a, a working data set. Uh, I think I already mentioned the, the issue of how important is it for some of these, uh, for, for people to have the ability to bring their code uh, into the cloud, uh, to the data, so you're not moving data across the internet, or maybe what people would really rather do is get uh, reduced data sets, download those over the over the internet, and then work with those data sets on whatever high performance computing systems they have access to, rather than doing their computing in the cloud. Um, so these are some of the ideas that I've heard. And um, yeah, this is what we're, these are some of the various things that need to be, to be sorted out as we think about what a, what a DAS data management system might look like. Her? A short question about this. Sure. So, Bob, my, my question is in the proposal, uh, did you have to specify what the eventual size of the DAS data that the facility would store would be? Because that would seem to be a question that's natural to ask, because if it's just unlimited, then that makes it more difficult to fund. And if you say, we, we want 20 petabytes. Yeah. 
Yeah, in the in the proposal, we didn't get too, if as I remember, we didn't get too specific about the size because the proposal was really for architecting a system. And so, you know, as part of the funded work, we wanted to do more work on well, what what is the eventual size and what's the structure, what's the mechanism for dealing with the metadata. So it was really an, an architecting uh, proposal, not an, not one to actually build it. Um, and, and we put in about a hundred terabytes for um, to fill facilitate the prototyping and design testing. Yeah, Marine. As a as a data user and not a data collector, I was thinking that it could be fun to have a Kaggle style competition of throwing data full resolution out there and say, hey, community, what do you want really out of the data? And thinking about last year data, is, is that okay? Well, tell us what's the breadth of research application today that could be used and pushing the to the community, really saying what the metadata is needed and what type of compression we can get and what can we get away with to compress that data while retaining as much as we can from the research perspective or getting as much as, a, as we can from that data. Uh, but it could be a one-year thing. The, the issue is the soft, one of the issues is software that is not ready to do all this data crunching. And so that could go along in the proposal of supporting um, community and software developers at the DMC to help making these core containers maybe for preparing people to have uh, computational tools. And I think containerization might be an option. Um, to have someone like base so working with Eileen Martin with Dazday would be a perfect starting point. Uh, but something along like that, or like pushing the data and the decision on what is useful data to the community. And I actually have a question for you, but I'll come over here. Uh -huh. So when when you talk about the the containers for the data, are you envisioning? So there's there's probably you know some element of that is sort of behind under the hood at the DMC. But I think you're, are you talking about that either because um, of the desire to have code that interacts with that data set directly or as a mechanism for actually down, and I'm, I may be not mm -hmm. expressing yeah. this well, but is it more of how you want to download it? You know, so there's so many containers, interpretation of container of the data, container of the software. Um, and NASA, they had uh, the slide rule system for, I said two data, so it's time series data, but it's very geospatial. So they had a piece of code and a library to read the H5 file integrated. And I think as a software container to uh, interface and interact with the, as a read only like data streaming in memory or data downloading from the DMMC, you could have a container, like a software container that would have integrated APIs to query the data and some some fancier way than we can uh, do, but also uh, some decimation tools, some re, you know IO tools that will be optimal for the type of data. So thinking about how do we detrend this large amount of data, like if there is innovation, software innovation to do this basic data processing that could be integrated in that kind of base container. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> is it, oh, there's a hand. Andres. Andres, Andres, you have your hand up. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thanks. This is Andres Charles. Yeah, very, very good. Uh, I think the last the last couple of comments have been very useful. Uh, certainly, I coming from the up from the interrogator provider side of things, and I think over many years working with industry, again, different companies have, uh, as, as Laura mentioned before. Uh, the important aspect is really to understand what type of uh, ultimate data you want, because a lot of the tools that we have implemented recently, and I'm going to say over many years, have been to do real-time processing. So if you want certain types of decimation, whether it is temporal or spatial, a lot of those tools have already been developed uh, for different industrial applications. Uh, so I think uh, just to follow, uh, I think an important point would be for us to, if you tell us, you know, guys, you, you guys are the dust providers, 
uh, we, we want data with this type of spacing, with this type of decimation. We have a lot of tools already for real time, detrending, filtering. So if there, if there are kind of like accepted uh, uh, processing workflows that you require to interpret this data, to do your, your research, uh, believe me, most, I at least I would, I'm gonna say the, the, the largest providers of, of DAS uh, systems already have a lot of that real time uh, processing implemented as part of our interrogator architecture. So I think I, I would definitely would welcome the feedback from all of you as a collective group to tell us, well, what do we need? Because you probably don't need to reinvent the wheel. Uh, we, we have already done a lot of stuff for, for oil companies and believe me, they have already paid for it. So. I, I think it is very low hanging fruit as long as you tell us exactly what type of processing workflows, uh, frequency contents, spatial resolutions, you need to do your research. And I think right now the I use and processing service have a lot of flexibility in them to, to make your life easier. That, that's it, thank you. Great, can I follow that up with a question to you? So in your- uh, Yes, sure. Okay, in your experience, have the people that have been using, like you, you mentioned the oil companies and using these workflows, have they also been archiving the raw data or are they generally satisfied once they've designed a workflow that that's okay and they're just gonna process it and not store the, the raw? Very early on, very early on, it did used to happen that people would store the raw data and uh, depending on the end application, whether it was to understand fluids or to understand seismic, uh, we started to develop a lot of those workflows. The, the, I would say the, the companies that have accepted these that are where the technology is very mature, they're really definitely moving away from storing raw data and basically just as, as long as they understand the processing chains that we run on these data sets, they're gonna be comfortable saying, okay, you know, this processing chain is suitable for seismic. This processing chain is suitable for temperature changes or for fluid dynamics changes. So I think, as, as long as you guys as users are comfortable with the, the different filters that we're applying, I think it should be fairly straightforward to, to store uh, basically semi-processed data. If even even the, the, the companies that have very deep pockets if who have been storing raw data for a while, they are moving away from that because sooner or later, we generate so much information that no one else is going to go and, and reprocess it and start generate uh, different decimations or lower frequency data sets. It is just too expensive even just to run on a cluster once you have already acquired it. So the real-time aspect of this, I think it is very important. But at the end of the day, you guys need to be comfortable with, uh, with the processing that is needed for your research products. Super interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Really appreciate that. Jerry, I see you have your hand up. Yes, and I, I just wanted to follow up on that and wondered, can you run more than one workflow? Can you have more than one uh, product coming out of the interrogator in your real-time systems? Yeah, no, that's a, that's an excellent question. And we get, again, certainly, at least I, I'll speak right now from the OptaSense experience. So we do have interrogators that basically can have different processing chains. So right now, for example, when we're doing micro seismic analysis, we have, a group of lasers that is going to be processed with a processing chain specific for micro seismic and induced seismicity detection. But we're also going to have a separate laser that is going to be focused for low frequency DAS and strain analysis. And those can run simultaneously. So again, depending on the application, again, right now you have the option of in real time, read the, read the, the, the stream from that DAS socket and then send it to a, to a seismic, send it to a low frequency DAS or to another acoustics measurement. So again, there's a lot of flexibility that has been developed uh, over the last five years to address this problem. Because unfortunately, there's gonna be engineers that are gonna be looking for very high frequency, and then they're gonna have the seismologists who want to very low frequency. So uh, there's uh, someone's noise is gonna be someone else's signal. So we do need to deal with that, but there's, there's flexibility depending on the interrogator, depending on the data rates that allow you to, to basically separate different processing chains in real time. To me, that's the key. It needs to work in real time. Interesting. 
Very interesting. Other comments on this, this area? Yeah, Bernardo? More of a question out of ignorance since I have not followed this at all. But um, if the video sounds like there is a lot of learning, uh, knowledge transfer that needs to happen between private companies that already have to use this type of data a lot, and then the scientific community in this much more cheap stream. Is there a mechanism for that? So <clears throat> the question was, is there a mechanism for the knowledge transfer from the private companies and the private sector that's been already more deeply engaged in DAS? And I think the academic and research community, which is operating with smaller budgets and in a more sort of distributed way. So I don't know if anybody wants to speak to that. I mean, I guess well, I can come. I can. Come. Well, okay. I can. I can answer. I can answer that directly. So, so certainly, there is a couple of the large uh, and for for the company of the big DAS users in industry. I'm going to say companies like Shell, Equinor, ConocoPhillips, uh, that have actually released uh, a lot of their workflows, uh, even in GitHub. So again, they do have some functionality that has been published already by them. Uh, certainly, in our case, again, we have a, a lot of those workflows. Once we implement it, even if it's for a company, again, they will be available with some of our interrogator uh, architecture. So again, those are processing chains that are already established that, again, I can tell you there's nothing specifically proprietary about uh, most of those uh, data uh, processing chains. So, so again, there's there's a little bit of a, a degree that, that that's done, certainly from us, I know. <clears throat> Some of our other, or some of the other DAS vendors that do similar things. Basically, each project that we have run for industry, I can tell you, we learn a lot about our instruments, about the processing, and that ends up becoming part of our products. So, to a degree, that's already have been taking place over the last years. Mm -hmm. And and then I guess there's also some um, sharing going on amongst. You know, I know the academic community at least, but maybe the industry is contributing as well. I know that there's been some some projects to set up software exchange and GitHub uh, uh, kind of software repositories. I guess um, I don't think I don't know if there's anybody here that's super familiar with what's already going on in that area. Who wants to speak to that? In, yeah, so I think the software is a really interesting side of this. And I guess I'd, if I could throw another question out there to the group, is just the, the idea of, well, I mentioned earlier of whether the, the model is, you know, bringing the code onto the cloud and working with, you know, being co-located with the data that's in the archive or in these models where maybe the workflows are running in real time and data is already being reduced, is it really the model that people are more comfortable being able to pull that data down to a, a local, like a departmental computer system or a cluster or something, because that's you're, you've got the data now and what you wanna do is your modeling and so forth and you're not really interested in using the, you know, the cycles on the cloud. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just a comment storage that was my original thought six years ago that should be pushing towards it but in the processing of a minute of data like 10 minutes we can buffer data transfer at the same time as we compute and so i'm actually less in a concern about having storage somewhere and having to be somewhere else if the data processing is longer than the data throughput so from on the cloud i was downloading data 
you know, all the places I get data, 90 kilobytes, I pay 40 dollars a week to store the data, maybe 100 dollars a week, but it cost me 40 dollars to do the whole thing in one day. Uh huh. And so then you you at that point you just pulled it down then and we're working with it on whatever your local resources were. Okay. But in there you have the serial computation, the data streaming is fine if the uh, if the computation is set enough within that chunk of data. Hmm. Okay. Perfect. This may not be directly related to the archiving question, but there are certainly projects with strong overlap between industry and academia. So uh, Andres uh, was a speaker at the American Rock Mechanics Association DAS workshop last June. And there, there were very many industry uh, presenters, but there were also academics like Khan Wu at Texas A&M and Gu Jin at uh, Colorado School of Mines, who used to be at Conical Phillips before he made the transition to academia. So maybe those are the people who could be the intermediaries. <laughs> I guess we, someone doesn't like this, this <laughs> objects to this conversation. <laughs> The youngest member of the audience. Okay, any any other comments on this before I ha hand it back to Casey? Because Ken, so I was I was intrigued by Andres's comment about working with the the deep pockets and maybe take advantage of that. I think that's fantastic. I I, I fear though that. That the workflows they've developed are very specific to the a product they're developing, and I and I think one of the concerns we have is in the science community we might I'm guessing that the the research parts of the industry used to keep a lot more data, and and that's kind of the state that that we're at where we don't quite know what we're going to do with all this data yet, so we want all the options available. That I means store everything until we get down to very narrow products that might be supported. But but as just, just one last this. I'll, I'll I'll go back to that chat. <laughs> Sorry, but but I'm just wondering: Are there opportunities to develop these workflows together with the manufacturers as we tick them off and say, "Okay, here's one we definitely are going to use." Can we? Is it a minor tweak to the existing workflows on the real time processors, or is it a is it something that we have to save up for, and and kind of work on our our own specialized development? And Chad, Chad had a comment. One of the challenges is transparency. Science is supposed to be repeatable. So the, the drive that Marine talked about of having your code in a repository and open source is not for sharing. <laughs> it's so your research can be repeated and there's transparency in your work. So that helper gets a little bit, it doesn't mean it's impossible, but it makes doing something the way the proprietary process a little bit more complex. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so the, the transparency of the process is very key, and, I, and, I, and it's essential in our field. But I mean, I think that's that's part of what maybe we can work with in industry is, is when these things are generally used enough such that everyone's doing the same thing on it, can that block that off? And if you're using a set of equipment to do a certain set of data collection, we, we turn on these processors and optimize the, the storage required from that. Uh, Andres, did you want to comment? On yes, I, yes. I'm sorry. I just I was I was talking on mute. Yes, yes. Thanks very much for that comment, Ken. And I really, I what I can tell you at least right now, very specific at least to the OptoSend side of things. Uh, a lot of those workflows, again, I can tell you my my, my as a background as my as a size, as an earthquake seismologist. There is nothing that I would say it's proprietary. Uh, there there may be some things about the interrogation is set up that it's maybe more specific to our type of interrogators but when it comes to preparing data for decimating for stacking for filtering those are things that we are certainly welcome to to share and uh, i can just from experience i can talk that 
I can mention that networks like Southern California network with, uh, with Caltech, a little bit of Northern California with, with Berkeley and Stanford. Uh, there's been a lot of, we, we work very closely with those teams. Uh, so they have comfort that whatever we're doing in our processing basically is things that are consistent with conventional stations that either SCSN or NCSN may be running. So it really, I, I don't think we have many proprietary processes that that we could not share as a as an instrument provider. So I think that shouldn't be a, a concern. And, and a, a, as, as long as we communicate with you guys, yeah, again, at the end of the day, you need to be comfortable with, with our processes. So maybe 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 that comfort will be reached after you acquire uh, a few terabytes of raw data, and then we try to reproduce the same result with the same processing chains. And maybe that's what it, if that's what it will take, we would definitely welcome it. But I can tell you, there's nothing, there's no specific black boxes that I would say, you know, I. I don't. I don't want to share this with Silixa or with Fibus or with many other companies that are doing that nowadays. Because again, it's at the end of the day, it's fairly simple processes. And the internal optical part of it that is, we don't really need to mess with it. It's it really after the fact. Once you send your 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 ping your your sequence of light pulses down those fibers, most of these processing chains where we change things, whether it is earthquake seismology or active seismic, uh, that's, that, again, that's traditional seismic processing. So I can say there's nothing really proprietary about that. So that is something that we can share for sure. Yeah, th th thank you for that. I, I appreciate that. And th this is not far off the, the discussions we've had uh, decades and decades ago with seismic acquisition systems where there, there are processes that are internal then maybe they could be proprietary. They have intermediate steps, but I think it's up to the community to find what needs to come out. Uh, and that, that's vendor, not vendor specific. That's say, as a product, if we're going to be collecting data for types, then this is what, you know, the vendors have to at least provide to get us. So it allows us to work those work, work processes in, whether that's through edge computing or directly from the, the system itself. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, just some uh, different thoughts about what part of the processing is black box and what part isn't. I mean, we use seismometers that have patents, and you know, there's proprietary information in those seismometers. But at the end of the day, they're just an electric mechanical device, and they make a voltage that you record with a digitizer and then a data logger. And so, I think what's interesting in DAS that I've experienced, it's maybe a little bit different is that you know at the end of the day there's a photodiode that's measuring something that they, you get phase out of and when i work with an interrogator a lot of times you know we get phase measurements out or sometimes they'll be converted to strain but you know the way that you get the phase measurement from the actual photodiode is that's kind of where the magic is and a lot of times there's calibration factors that when you go and try to actually understand how that's done then uh, you learn more and more and you get into these proprietary algorithms. And in, in my experience, the difference can matter that, you know, we've had situations with, with some manufacturers where, uh, you know, it's hard to speak in generalities. I understand there's a lot of differences in how this is done. Sometimes this is done mostly in software. Sometimes it's done mostly in hardware. Sometimes it's done with something kind of in between called a field program, programmable gate array, an FPGA. And the, the FPGAs, you know, they're faster than software, but you can't change them at compile time. And so we've had the situations where, you know, we'll change the FPGA, which is basically like changing software, but not uh, variable at runtime. And then this will completely change the phase observations that we make with, with a repeatable active seismic survey. And so, you know, then when you go to want to understand the details, you know, that's proprietary and no one wants to tell us that. And so uh, this is kind of the specific point where I've encountered uh, some black box issues where I would like to know more about how phase is actually me measured. You know, we see some artifacts go away when we change how the photodiode information is converted into a, a phase signal. Some other art artifacts appear and then, you know, the manufacturers might just say, well, 
why are you worried? Like the artifact went away. Isn't that great? And it's like, well, I have to be able to write a paper about this. And, you know, if I'm honest, I'll say that we collected the data set twice and the artifact went away when we applied the second black box and not the first one. And so, you know, I think on, on the other hand, you know, for other parts of the processing chain, like, you know, we'll have some software interface in the interrogator and the data is like decimated or something. It's like, well, I don't have any problem with that. You know, I don't need to, if the decimator is working correctly and you apply Butterworth filter, like you say you do or whatever, then, you know, less concerns about the fact that that is actually a compiled code that they're not giving me the source to. It appears to be a, a regular old decimator and that's, there's nothing objectionable there, but there does seem to be some kind of magic that's giving us signals that are, yeah, there's more going on than I understand. So thanks. I guess I'd be curious since we have someone on the line, what the OptiSense perspective is on this. <laughs> yeah, that's and yeah, that 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 and you're you're absolutely right, Brad. That uh, different interrogators again, they are going to be uh, certainly even from the way we change gauge length. Some of them are have a hardware component. Some of them are hardware. Comp some of them are software component. Uh, and yeah, there is what what we have tried to do in, in in ours has been to if if you're using our system again, we have a very specific transfer function from those phase measurements into strain. And we, use, we, we do try to provide that, all of those transfer functions. So at least uh, when it comes for you to try to ma matching the, the optical measurements to, to a geophone or to a broad science seismometry, you have more uh, control on that and, and you have at least that peace of mind. But I, I, I certainly hear you that that is the part where when you look at the patterns of the different interrogators, that's where they're gonna change uh, quite a bit. And that, that part, maybe could be tri trickier to, to release. <laughs> the, the, that's actually not the part I was talking about. So once you have phase, I'm fine getting strain. That's pretty straightforward. I was actually talking about how the photodiode information, which record, which is a voltage, gives you a phase, right? Because the photodiode converts photons into, into electrons, basically. And then mm -hmm. somehow that, that electronic signal is turned into a continuous output of phase information. And there's, you know, a million different strategies. Some of these are published in the literature, some of them aren't. And you can kind of try to infer from uh, which academics went on to found which companies you can kind of infer which, <laughs> what, what's going on in different boxes. But the, it's actually the kind of photodiode to phase. Phase to strain, I'm pretty happy with. Yeah, no, and, and, and Brad, yeah, this, and, and believe me, we have a, we have a, a, a our team who all, we have a, team of guys who really are specific just look at FPGA processing and, and yeah I've seen changes I've I've made recommendations on some of that processing based on my background as, as a seismic user yeah, and yeah there is yeah there's I, I I hear you on that one we, we could see how much of that could be released but but yeah that's that that basically that we, since we control a lot of our sensitivity in the interrogators at those uh, stages in the data interrogation, we usually don't, we wouldn't be releasing that, but, but no, point taken. I, I definitely see where you're coming from <laughs> on that. Herb, go for it. So nobody ever confused me with being a photonics engineer, but uh, I was curious about that question too, Brad, because a photodiodes measure intensity and so how to get phase. Well, uh, the metrologists like Bethel Morrow, who will speak at uh, the afternoon novel methods, such they use interferometers, so that's pretty clear how you get phase. But the um, internet transceivers, the commodity transceivers that send the internet signals every day, they're measuring phase in a forward direction of their uh, signal because they do something like quadrature key uh, uh, phase signal uh, transmission. And so they need to know both the uh, uh, real and imaginary parts. And there's some device uh, that's called a 90 degree optical hybrid. And what that does is if on the transmission side, you split the uh, signal into an in-phase and quadrature uh, component, and then you combine them, transmit it, and then on the receiving end, you take the two, uh, the signal and 
put it back through a 90 degree hybrid, then you've got the two components of the complex uh, electrical field and you take the arc tangent. Uh, and they'll average this uh, phase over from the terahertz range, which is the 1550 nanometers uh, over like 10,000 cycles to get an average phase. And they're keeping up with the phase because each individual, you know, two bits in quadrature phase key signaling is having to determine that phase. So that's um, out there in the literature, but I don't know how the uh, DAS interrogators do that. Other comments? I was, I guess I'll ask a question and I'll direct this to Brad, but I, I was interested in your, in your experiment. So this is kind of segueing a little bit off this, but in this idea of processing raw data. So like in the experiment that you described that you're doing across the Puget Sound, I mean, have you been in that kind of working, exploring different strategies going all the way back to kind of the raw data or did you, most of what you've been doing, I mean, you've, you've used this SVD analysis um, and seems like you're, you know, your processing is, and your experimentation is downstream from, and I may be misunderstanding a little bit about what you did. Yeah, so, so at Whidbey Island, just really briefly, uh, we both changed acquisition parameters like gauge length and uh, sampling rate like uh, we did. Let's see, is Alex still on the line here? Uh, maybe not. Uh, with Alex Douglas and Shima Abadi at UW Bothell, we did an active seismic survey. So uh, we'll, I think present a little bit of that tomorrow in one of the talks. But uh, so for that, we turned up the, the sampling rate. And you know that's, that's fairly simple. But we also, you know, at one point we're, speaking with the folks at uh, Centella, operating a Centella on Xbox. And uh, they said, hey, we have this new FPGA. It, uh, it you know, clips more easily. And then there's artifacts. You don't want to use it for active seismic surveys. But if you want to observe ocean swell, it has much better response at lower frequencies. And sure enough, you know, we switched the FPGA. And all of a sudden, we can see the, the lower frequencies better. And so uh, it also as a funny side note, makes it completely impossible to do the SVD comparison over the two because the noise characteristics change so much. But uh, in any case, you know, this is just kind of one of these things is, you know, it made the data apparently much better. It reduced the noise. We can see signals we couldn't see before, but we don't really know what's going on. And I mean, I haven't even pushed very hard about trying to get them to release the, the code or tell me in more detail what's going on because all indications are they it's kind of a closely held trade secret. And so I'm so far just been kind of happy with it, but it, in terms of things that could be improved, you know, I, I don't mean to single them out, I guess, specifically, because I think this is fairly common among among the folks that are actually doing this type of uh, this type of work for for profit that it's kind of one of their main <laughs> one of their main trade secrets. Um, does that, does that, yeah, help? that helps. Yeah. yeah, I'm I'm kind of reminded in in just in broadband seismology of you know in the data loggers where people use different finite impulse response filters and some of them are minimum phase filters, some of them are linear phase filters and so forth. And that that decisions made at acquisition time, not after acquisition. I mean that's something that's that's you know once you do it, you set the data logger up that way. That's the way your data are. So kind of reminds me a little of that of what you were just describing. So. But maybe, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, in, in a way, yeah, no, it's, it's hard because okay. we're using the microphone that's in the yeah. laptop for the remote people. So, uh, okay. Uh, you know, in, in a way, all that really matters, like, I don't think most seismologists care about the data logger, um, the, the, the response, as long as it's recorded, right? And so as long as you can reproduce it. So maybe the reproducibility is just the important part, and it's, 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 it's good point. or at least Reproducibility is an important part. I won't say it's the only part, but is, as long as you can record that and know what the response was, so that when you go back and try to figure out, you know, something about the data in the future, that that'll be preserved. Yeah, but I'm, I'm sure that's. I don't think there's anybody on the metadata group here. Maybe I'm wrong about that, but surely that's got to be in the metadata <laughs> that uh, that we want to keep track of. 
Yeah, yeah. For for broad, I mean, in the example of broadband data, it, it definitely is yeah. metadata. So yeah, yeah, interesting. That's but, a good point. But what the perturbations you're describing are, in many cases, irreversible. You made that choice. You documented, but you can't back it out. Yep. I, yeah. No. Very true. And I, I and I think that's what I was hearing Brad saying. Also, when you changed FPGAs and you collected new data now with a different FPGA in the in the processing chain, and yeah, you couldn't go between the two. That's right. It's all upstream of the reporting. Yeah. Yep. I think that we might be jumping down an instrument rabbit hole <laughs> there. <laughs> <laughs> which is always fun for me, but but that's also one of the challenges that we face on trying to serve this to the community is not only what is it once you buy an instrument and learn its response, but if it's, there's going to be a pool, is how do we validate uh, once it comes back to a facility? Do we have a test range? What's the calibration procedure such that we can we can verify that that is still functioning as it was expected to for, you know, maybe different types of instruments will have different types of calibration systems, but we'll need to be able to quantify that for the metadata for the next usage. And I think that's the, the part we struggle with from the serving the community with a pool of instruments is uh, that, that could be tricky. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Ken, this is Andres again. I think that that's a very important point. And uh, of course, not, not certainly you guys are struggling with it. Uh, uh, industry has also struggled with it. Uh, and we have right now, uh, there is this uh, other organization, CFOM, that has been testing and basically uh, pretty much forcing us all of, all of our, all of the DAS vendors to ensure that our measurements are within certain dynamic ranges, that the crosstalk is well understood in the, in the measurements. So that data is it's available. Again, it's not something that at least uh, I, we, we usually release uh, unless to, to a specific clients, but I can, uh, I, I can see how if there's a, a, a gatekeeper that, would, that could have that information, uh, again, it would be available. Uh, again, we, we have been making basically there, we have different types of fiber stretches with different type of stimuli on the fibers. That will tell us well what is your your frequency bandwidth, uh, crosstalk, uh, dynamic range, things like that, yeah. and we know exactly how each of our instruments will perform. Uh, again, we just I, and I can tell you just from just so you guys know where, where we're coming from. We usually do not release it because we don't. Uh, what will happen is that then other interrogator providers again when they go and they provide numbers, it becomes a, a numbers game. And say, well, you know, I have, I have two more decibels on this, uh, on this specific metric, or I have uh, X amount of hertz more on this specific frequency. So as long as there's a baseline that I think is needed for your specific applications, we probably can provide, we can release information. Say, look, as we, this is the bar for crosstalk. This is the bar for for frequency band in the low end, in the high end. And I think there, we probably can provide information in maybe a more sanitized way that, that you can use it. So I think, because again, we have been doing, uh, again, industry went through these 10 years ago. So, yeah, so we build the protocol. And again, traditionally, when we go with an oil company, they're going to have some sort of NDA in place with us. So we know that we can share all of those metrics and then they'll decide which, uh, which interrogator to use. So. Yeah, that's uh, we we have all of that toolkit available. So I I think if if there's a specific baselines and, and maybe maybe for this what will need to happen is uh, uh, there's there's a few projects already that have had at least uh, two or three of of the main DAS uh, providers acquiring data in the same time with in tandem with broadband seismometers. Maybe maybe that's what the seismology community needs. Maybe they, we need as part of the funding. Ken or, or the, the Irish people is to say, well, we, we need to bring a, a project where we're going to be recording on one month for uh, maybe maybe this earthquake a month in, back in, in February could be an opportunity for that. Say, guys, there's a, five, there's a cable that has uh, 200 fibers. Let's connect each one of the interrogators, maybe a project funded by NSF or by whoever, 
So at least we understand all of the transfer functions of the, of the interrogators. So again, that, that, that's probably what will be needed at the end of the day. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that's good. Um, oh, Nate, you have a... Um, I think just from someone sitting on the other side of the industry now, having sat in that seat one time, uh, it's important to make one comment. Um, I think the transfer functions already known. The strain to you know phase transfer function, like Brad mentioned, is in a large way already known. And so it's this community has an opportunity to basically make a set of data standards requests. So you could you could request data products, which uh, uh, that sentiment's kind of going around here. Um, you know, earthquake waveforms in strain. You know, if you want that, then allow the interrogator companies of the industry to kind of come around and try and get the best signal to noise ratio that they can provide you as the end user. Um, Brad's example is one in which I think the, it sounds like the industry had this application of low frequencies and was able to achieve a better signal to noise ratio in a particular way. But I'd say that the, the strain that you got out was probably the same between those two methods. So the actual seismic SNR is different than the optical SNR. And I think by allowing, by, by really allowing, you know, making a set of requests, you have an opportunity to actually, you know, frame this conversation um, for, for the industry. That's it. Yeah, that was a new conversation now, so let's say up here, yeah. <laughs> Oh, oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, interesting, interesting discussion is complex, uh, <laughs> to say the least. Um, I guess, uh, unless there's more comments, I guess I'd wrap up this part of the conversation by just saying that if you have other ideas about what's needed from a, a community perspective for managing data, archiving data, distributing the data, please um, you know, get in touch with Jerry, get in touch with Chad or me or Kent uh, or Casey. We're all um, happy to chat about that. Uh, if you wanna go even further and be engaged at some point, if it comes to us writing another proposal for some such, some uh, capability of that sort, uh, we usually, when we as a consortium prepare proposals, we usually have community members helping us uh, frame the content and the, you know, and the focus of the proposal. So if that's something, if you really want to engage more deeply in this, we'd welcome that. Um, but yeah, I think this, this information is really, really helpful. And it's, uh, it's great to get a sense of kind of where the DAS technology is at in terms of, you know, what people need for using the data for the reproducibility aspect, the transparency aspect the interplay between the soft, the downstream software, the processing that's done at the instrument, the documentation of that processing that's done at the instrument. I think that's, uh, it's been really informative for me. So uh, hopefully for the rest of you, I think there was a comment in there that'd be a great segue to, I think one of the things we want to talk about, which is this upcoming month of DAS data. And I don't know if we have anybody who's deeply, uh, working on that, or is planning who can speak to that in more detail? Just, yeah, the recap of Andreas's talk. Okay, I think that'd be terrific because I think one of the things, just to make the connection, why I say there's a segue there is that I think through the sharing of data sets coming in from different people, from different interrogators, and so forth, and different installations, we're going to learn a lot, and I feel like in uh, typical broadband seismology, anytime, you know, we've compared data sets, whether it's from co-located instruments or just, uh, or non-co-located instruments, we've always learned something uh, about data management and data handling. And so I think that's going to be the case uh, here with this month of DAS data.
Right. And then I just need to share. Sorry. Oh, wait. Oops. No, I am sharing that screen. Oops. So, I just have to I just turn the screen share off. I'm sorry. <laughs> just have to make sure they can see too. Share my Zoom controls. Sorry. <laughs> it's always hard to find all the things. Perfect. Yeah. I didn't close Zoom. Nope, but everybody's still there. I apologize, I'm not actually the best at this. There we go, share screen, okay. Okay, I think you should be good now. So the third talk that we had at the community forum last week, uh, was presented by Andreas Swistefeld uh, at Norsar. And uh, he, he got this idea, oh, probably about a year ago now, in which uh, he thought, wouldn't it be great if everybody with an interrogator and uh, fiber would turn it on all around the world at a common time so that for uh, global earthquakes over magnitude five, uh, we would have a database of recordings all around the world. And his idea of Global Das Month has really taken off. And I think there's gonna be participation from somewhere between maybe 35 and 50 different uh, cable uh, installations and interrogators. And it is going to be truly global. So the month that's been picked uh, um, is February of 2023. So we're not too uh, far away now. And the idea is that you can record continuously, uh, but you could also just record on some kind of triggered basis for events. And then... Zach Spica with his um, storage at the Michigan HPC still has space for these 20 or 30 terabytes that will be collected during Global Das Month. And uh, this will also be a very valuable trial run of how you take data from many different interrogators, many different cable installations, all focused on the same events. And uh, the USGS catalog from February of 2022 showed Andreas that we can expect on the order of 150 earthquakes greater than magnitude five. And I mean, they're, they're clustered, but they're located all around the world. So uh, this will be uh, an opportunity to identify bottlenecks that might obstruct a fiber optic global seismometer network. So, you know, the worldwide net uh, could be the worldwide DAS net. <laughs> and uh, this can be a little bit of a, of a trial run for it. Uh, and then other objectives would be to collect DAS data globally, as I said, during the same uh, period for science, advance. Uh, common data format efforts so we can learn uh, about how uh, different uh, formats are accepted. And I, I kind of see that the data that will be stored uh, and archived, you know, we you can look at it uh, as the community voting as to which ones are downloaded and which ones turn out to be uh, the most useful and productive. Uh, 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 it'll develop um, policies for data sharing, and we'll learn about available uh, infrastructure. So uh, because these won't be continuous data, uh, it was brought up, well, how about having everybody that has continuous data uh, monitoring capability, let's have one 24-hour period, and I assume these will be UTC, 
uh, turn on their continuous monitoring. This also won't overwhelm the PubDesk archive to just do one day instead of 30. And so maybe even during the forum, uh, Andreas picked the middle of the month, February 15th. And um, let's see, I can't. Oh, I don't know what the, <laughs> there's some stuff that copied that makes no sense. Is it? Maybe that was all I had. Did I have more? I think there was. Yeah, I thought there was three, maybe. Uh, I think we just have to. There we go. Oh, it should it should work now. All right. So he his whole presentation is on the uh, event YouTube uh, archive at uh, the DAS RCN website. But so, you know, what is it that you're going to share? Uh, and so th there's some guidelines uh, that you might follow as to how much data around an, uh, uh, an earthquake that you might store. The sampling rate will be limited to 100 hertz. Uh, the spatial sampling should be about 20 meters. But, you know, this is a totally volunteer effort, so there's no um, imposition on what exactly you should archive. It'll be archived under your institution and uh, your metadata, so it's identified that way, and if other people want more de detail, they'll know uh, who they can contact. Uh, one maybe slightly contentious uh, piece of information is the latitude and longitude, the geographic location of your cable uh, network. And so I think it was decided that uh, you could be a little bit vague about where uh, the location uh, of your interrogator is. Oh, you know, I think if I had uh, 30 other recordings and I then had a hypocenter for that uh, earthquake and I had the, a relative, uh, per, relatively precise time of your recording, I might figure out where you are. Uh, and then there was the question of what file format and there's no imposition at all on uh, your choice of file format. And for a while, there was some discussion. You know, did everybody have to convert to a single file format? Did everybody have to convert uh, from strain to strain rate or vice versa? And I, I think the right decision was made that these will be uh, investigator choice. There's, there's no intent to uh, have any kind of uh, requirement your data be in a certain format or uh, measuring a certain physical parameter in order to be uh, included as part of this archive. So it's something that I'm certainly looking forward to. Uh, we have uh, what we call a 3D DAS array in uh, the former home state gold mine in Leeds, South Dakota. Uh, we've got about 3,000 feet of cable uh, at a depth between uh, 4,100 and 4,850 deep along a spiral ramp. And uh, the, right now the cable just kind of lies on the surface and we're hoping to somehow get it buried a couple of inches and cement it in uh, so that we do uh, a better job than we're able to so far in recording uh, teleseisms. So I think that was uh, a recap of what uh, Andreas proposed. So I think the next part of the program is uh, for individuals to talk about anything, including, you know, what they're working on. Brett? I have a quick question about the DAS on. Has, is there something like an MOU about publications if we contribute data? Uh, you mean, are there... What's the plan with publications and, and authorship? I mean, like, are they going to... How will people who contribute be credited or is there a plan for that? I, is that is there anything about publications that discuss? Um, so there is discussion about 
a uh, SRL uh, publication to describe Global Gas Month. Um, it's at a very preliminary stage. And, and no dis and if no discussion of like if somebody downloads one of the data sets and publishes with it, any discussion of that sort? Not that I recall, but I think it should be. I, I mean, obviously, at the very least, I think attribution is expected. But uh, PubDAS is an open archive. So, uh, and the expectation is you upload your data by March 31st. Is there March 31st? Yes, by March 31st. So this doesn't just drag on forever, uh, you know, like some monographs do, uh, waiting for your data. I, you can upload it continuously. You can upload it daily. That'll be your choice, but sort of a cutoff will be the end of March. Um, but that what that means is that there's no embargo right on your data where you and your students can be assured of first crack at your own data. So I, I can see that as being a potential issue. Uh, I, you know, maybe the the thing is if, uh, I, I'm just thinking out loud here on some way around this, and it is maybe to say that for a one-year period, if you use somebody else's data, you must contact the researcher and uh, discuss any publication plans. But that's a good, good issue to, to bring up, Brad. I mean, in a way, it seems like the, you know, it goes back to the basis of why seismologists are so good at sharing data compared to the other fields. We're studying teleseismic earthquakes. I mean, I mean that was just, you know, I run out of things to think I would have a student work on with lots of data all over the world to say, but this, that's totally different. That's super interesting. Right. But just having our one array, we, some calibration stuff, but it's really so much more interesting to have the whole data set. But I don't anticipate there'll be big embargo issues for that reason. It's just better for everybody to have to have it in the open. So I imagine the, the kind of publication that would be most interesting to the community would be one that utilizes, you know, as much of the 35 or 50 different recordings in terms of information about the earthquake. Uh, rather than focusing on any specific data set. I assume that would be, there'd be like a DOI minted, for example, such that, I mean, if you, if you wrote a paper using 50 different... That's a good point. So I, I think each archive data set in PubDAS is assigned a DOI. I remember for our data set, I had to go through some organization, FSDN or something, to uh, acquire a DOI for the data set. So that's something that each, uh, it would be referenceable and every data set could um, have a DOI. Is this at the level of being manageable for people to, to put in it? You know, even if somebody used all of them, that might be reasonable. Might be as much as possible to get that into the publication if they had 35 or 40 DOIs that they needed to, to list out. But it would certainly get the individual contributors the ability to have some traceability on you know what publications resulted from their work, which is really nice. Right, right. I mean, you have to show your data sources, and so those DOIs would do that. I found it no fun filling out the FSDN form. So I, I think this is what they call uh, uh, in uh, elementary school sharing time. I mean, 
That's an Her, maybe, maybe, if I may interrupt, this is Andres, and I'm going to have to leave. But uh, we, in the interest of sharing, okay. uh, for those who I, we we are we're going to be providing a, already. A couple of institutions will have some of our interrogators. Uh, I checked in our inventory. We still have a couple of our uh, interrogators, our third generation that can sample ten kilometers. Uh, so if you have a fiber available. I put, a, I put my email in the chat box, uh, reach out to me. Uh, again, there may be an opportunity. If it's closer to where we have offices, uh, that is significantly easier. So Southern California, Houston, uh, London, uh, Dubai, that definitely helps. But again, we may still have a couple of instruments. So if you have a cable that you think could be exciting, uh, reached out to me, we still have a couple of units uh, that could be available for that month. Thank you, Anderson. Every time you make that offer, I remind you about your ODH4 for our- Yeah, that one, that, that one it's already slotted there, uh, Herb, so don't, don't worry about that one. <laughs> so I, I remember this as show and tell, but uh, sh sharing is fine. Anybody out in um, Etherland? Come on, there are people out there who have uh, plans. Right. Okay, so should we just go into uh, we, we were going to just have some networking time, right? Oh, yeah, I was just going to comment on that. So, sorry, I find this this early on in the discussion, um, but Andreas was looking for interesting fibers, and I believe OptiSense is coordinating with Zhang Wen Zen on the illumination of the South Pole fiber, and I believe that's supposed to happen. January, maybe into February, but I'm not quite sure the long term, how long that's going to be recorded. But that's a, it's an eight kilometer fiber that's centered into the ice um, about, it's probably about four or five meters deep at this point, but it's been there for 20 years. And so there's some dark fibers on that that are going to be illuminated. And that would be fantastic if that were available for the St. Valentine's Day event. But Andres, do you know when they're scheduled to go if he's still there? Yes, yeah, so they're, they're actually heading uh, uh, on right after, I want to say the 24th or the 25th. Uh, and the, the plan is for the interrogator to, it's going to be on for a number of months, certainly including February. So yeah. I'm, I'm not sure who's the gatekeeper of that data, but I know it's going to be recorded. This probably is Zhang Wen Zen. And so, yeah, this is this is this is for Zhang Wen Shan. There's there's a few other people in, as part of that program. So I don't know who the main PI is. I know he's one of them, but I know there's other institutions involved. I think it's Doug Weens and maybe Rick Astor and yeah, yeah. yeah but that, the IUs are going to be on for that. I mean, we're very excited about that that specific connection. It's using our latest. Uh, we, we we have two types of interrogators that are going to be going in that to that fiber, to that cable. Great, thank you. That'll be very exciting. So I'll go ahead and just do a little show and tell of just the other activities for the RCN that um, I'll be working on organizing with some community members um, in 2023 as we conclude the RCN, which will be um, starting with um, Global Death Month, of course, um, but then also uh, we'll have some uh, field experiences that we've been wanting to do for a while, but of course, getting everyone together physically has been difficult, but we are 100% going to do those in um, likely March and uh, May, and those will be in Houston and um, in Colorado um, at school, Colorado School of Mines. School of Mines yeah. um, and the Rice, Rice, yes. Um, so those will be uh, two-day courses uh, meant for a, a wide range of um, DAS experience um, people, but mainly um, after sort of new, newer users. 
um, just to get some more hands-on um, experience with fibers. Uh, so the, the, look for an announcement on those um, soon, um, as soon as I get it ready. Uh, then the other activities we have, we'll have a capstone workshop to, to sort of uh, bring together everything we've learned throughout the years of this RCN, which has been entirely executed under COVID. So we've learned a lot from that, um, but we've learned a lot from other things too. So, um, so we'll be uh, also organizing that in likely the May, June timeframe. Um, in 2023 as well to conclude our activities um, here on a on a high note. So, uh, anything else? Oh yeah. Also, um, since this intersects with another project that I'm working on um, as part of our scope, um, the rupture and fault zone observatory um, idea that um, this concept that is being um, developed amongst the community members um, to instrument very close to the faults uh, systems in California. Um, of course, DAS gets mentioned in, in every venue these days. So um, we will be having a, a sort of DAS um, and distributed um, observation centric breakout session on this. Um, it'll be virtual and um, likely hosted uh, early in 2023. Um, so this will be an opportunity to bring together two projects that I'm working on um, together. So um, also look for that announcement. Got a lot to do. So once AG is over, hopefully you'll be hearing from me a lot. Um, any questions about any of those or comments? Just add a couple of quick comments on on two of those things. On the capstone workshop, we one of the things we're thinking is that the capstone workshop would produce as its output kind of a vision document for NSF that really lays out kind of what are, what the future research directions, future needs that the science community has from to, to convey to NSF. So again, this is at the end of this whole uh, research coordination network activity. And so we're thinking that could be a, uh, you know, we started the RCN several years ago. It seemed uh, that, you know, a lot of people were just starting to find their way with DAS. A lot has happened in that time. The field has really progressed. I mean, you can see it even just from, uh, you know, listings of DAS presentations at AGU. Uh, they're popping up in all different sessions, right? It's not a DAS session. It's just DAS as a capability and a technology that's used for different purposes uh, um, in, in different fields. And so it does make it a bit challenging to think about what the workshop, the paper coming out of this capstone workshop, how it should be framed. So if you have thoughts or ideas on that, um, you know, let us know, because we do think that that, that kind of a, uh, a roadmap, if you will, for NSF is important. Um, and then I thought I'd just add just a tiny bit on this rupture and fault zone observatory concept of making essentially observations directly on the fault. And I think in that context, DAS has come up in at least th three different orientations, if you will, along fault observations from some uh, offset relative to the fault to give, you know, fault parallel uh, capability, perhaps to image uh, rupture as it's moving along the fault. It's also been uh, ideas have been kicked around for fault crossing observations and borehole observations that are near or in the fault zone uh, to look at structure with depth um, and behavior with depth uh, over time. And so if any of those three things interest you, you know, please participate in this session that Casey mentioned. It'll be kind of late January, early February timeframe, I think. And uh, yeah, just wanted to add to that. I'd like to close with just two things. So, thank you. Brad. So, uh, just uh, the spirit of, you know, more discussion points, uh, you know, there's a, a group of people, there's like five or six people at UW who are doing distributed acoustic sensing stuff. And so there's a big assortment of projects that are going on at UW. So, uh, we have two projects in Antarctica that are going on right now. We are currently collecting data on the McMurdo ice shelf, uh, just outside of McMurdo base. And then when the interrogator is done there, we're going to fly it to the Allen Hills and do a site survey for a borehole that might contain the oldest ice ever discovered, or at least it's a good candidate. Um, kind of just doing some site characterization for that borehole. Uh, in the other ice sheet, we're going to move Greenland this summer. We have 
funding for a research vessel that we're going to drive dangerously close to a uh, cabin glacier and try to put the a, like a fiber directly uh, on this floor, the ocean floor and a fjord in front of the glacier. Um, there's a good chance that we'll actually have to hire a local fishing boat instead because the research vessels are really risk adverse. And uh, local stuff, let's see, on the way back from, or I guess non-polar stuff, on the way back from Antarctica, the interrogator is going to spend some time at, at a volcano in New Zealand uh, in the Cook Inlet, hopefully as soon as we get over some uh, legal negotiations for deploy an interrogator in Homer, which is also going to be very near a volcano, Augustine Volcano in Cook Inlet in Alaska. And we're negotiating, actually, we finally have a contract written up and just need to pull the trigger on a deployment at Mount Rainier National Park that will obviously be in, uh, of interest for studies on that volcano. So let's see, that's ice sheets and volcanoes. Uh, there's some things going on with soil moisture that I think are a little bit more uh, up in the air at this point, but collaborating with folks in the UK to uh, do a survey of uh, some cropland actually in, in England, probably in the uh, early part of, uh, of the next year. And beyond that, I think I've hit the big ones. There might be some other stuff. And then in the meantime, we just leave the one running on campus all the time. So we get a lot of stuff that happens in kind of around Seattle. We just call that one CDAS. Um, but yeah, that's that's what we're up to in a nutshell. There's probably other things I'm forgetting, but uh, that those are the big ones. Well, is that all? <laughs> well, it's like it, well, it, it's, it's like six people. So you know, I'm, it's, I would it's it's not all me. Yeah, yeah, it's a lot of fun. Cable couples the ice so beautifully. Uh, so the two things are uh, first of all tomorrow. Uh, Nate Lindsay, Dante Frada, myself, and our computer scientist, Paul Barford, we've uh, organized a special session on novel methods and fiber optic ground uh, vibration. Uh, the uh, in-person session will be from 4.15 to 6.15 at McCart Place, room uh, 104A. This will be a chance to see the next new thing. And then finally, I can't tell you how much we owe to Casey uh, at her hold for all the work she's done in organizing uh, this workshop, all of the webinars, all of the steering committees. She is the glue for the DAS RCM. So thank you very much, Casey. All right, thanks everyone. Um, really appreciate you sticking out uh, both online and in person. I think this has been really productive, um, but now I think we will conclude. The recording will be made available in some form. We will maybe trim some parts out just if, for the sake of making sure it's comprehensible. Um, so I'll, I'll make sure it actually is on the other side there. Um, if there's any questions, just reach out to me and uh, yeah, make sure you check out both of those sessions tomorrow. Lots of desks on our first day of AGU.